welcome to this bonus episode of Tim Talk, the podcast, most usually, about the DC animated universe, co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. I'm Cameron Dexter. And we are back for our 2021 year in review. Our final year Our in final review. year in review, actually, yes. And uh, also worth noting, uh, part of the reason we ended up having to do this is this marks our 50th bonus episode. <sighs> 50 bone episodes. F- sorry. 50 Bo- bone episodes? <laughs> Are we shortening things now? I I wish I could say that was me making like a douchey a breve. I'm just tired. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just tired and can't think. We're not that kind of podcast. No. <laughs> We're the opposite. We like to really stretch things out. There's no shortening in any topic. <laughs> I'm I'm just gonna skirt around uh, the the combination of words uh, bone and stretching things out and just move along here swiftly. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's our 2021 review. Um, a weird, like a hard year to review in some way. Well, obviously we're not reviewing the whole year. If I were, I would give it a four. Uh, I guess three out of five. Oh, I was going out of 10. Oh, okay. I was like, because we usually go like out of five. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like on one hand, I finally found like my dream job, which has been super fucking cool and like cool opportunities along the way. But on the other hand, a lot of other shit really, really sucked. Mm -hmm. So so we'll we'll specifically be talking about television and movies. Exactly. Our forte. Yes. Our forte, our entertainment. uh, We'll be sticking with that. But even within that, a weird year to review, because I think you might have some problem was like, having a really hard time finding enough movies to fill out a top five, but also having a really hard time whittling down enough TV shows Yeah, to fill out a top this five. This has been a TV-heavy year for us. Well, it makes sense. We are at home for almost the entirety of it. That's true. You know, like, I, I think I saw, like, maybe 33 new movies this year. I think you were around the same. Yeah, I was, like, 36, 37. Yeah. And that's including, like, straight-to-streaming movies. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, That that's on top of the, like, six holiday movies I watched that were all fine oh sweet jesus cameron you can you can do better i can you can do better than annual holiday garbage (laughs) so um but a weird year nonetheless uh hopefully you all had an okay year (laughs) and had some really good entertainment so we'll we'll dive into this um i think it's fair to say like there will be spoilers probably for some things there will be a longer discussion around spider-man no way home and we will flag before we get into that that we'll be going into full spoiler territory at that time and of course there's always time stamps down in the show notes if you want to jump around a little bit yes um but let us start off with some some tv here uh so we're gonna go in our usual fashion counting from five up to one going back and forth and and catching whenever we have a similar thing so Cameron, why don't you start us off what was your number five tv show of 2021 great i think we we weirdly this year we share a lot of common interest in television shows i feel like usually we're, we're pretty split <laughs> i think that is fair on both counts yes <laughs> um, and so i i'm gonna guess we have three overlapping things okay. including this one okay my number five is sex ed season three we shall get to that yep <laughs> all right uh, my number five is only murders in the building. Okay, well, that's my number four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can talk about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. Um, it's so fucking charming. It's so good. <laughs> it's just like I never would have thought that Selena Gomez would make a perfect comedy pairing with Steve Martin and Martin Short, but she did. Yeah, she's well, incredible. You, I assume, you never watched Wizards of Waverly Place. It's a very fair assumption, Cameron, <laughs> and yes, you're right. I never did. Uh, she she plays very similar characters between both shows. Okay, where she's the like, not not the, not the antithesis of comedy, but she's you know she's always the dark edge, the the kind of the straight man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't really even call her a straight man. She's just like the darker voice. But yeah, we'll go a straight man. Okay. For, yeah. for simplicity. Mm-hmm uh she's so good at it she is oh, which she's is weird because really, like, i feel really like good. this is so far from her like real life persona yeah uh but i mean she's been playing this kind of character for you know eight years i i've never really seen her in anything um prior to this but she's so good at being dry mm-hmm. and she brought that sort of like yeah dark mysterious edge to the whole thing but just like the the whole show was just really quirky and fun and like such a weird concept and like maybe we're slightly biased as podcasters <laughs> that it's about a podcast but i thought even the sort of commentary on 
podcasting and podcasters and podcast listeners didn't feel like it was written by someone who didn't understand that world. It actually felt like, oh, yeah, this is not far off. Yeah. Which oftentimes you, you kind of were like, oh, this is going to be really shitty. Like I think of um, uh, the Halloween reboot from David Gorgon, which I overall really like. But in that, there are these two like true crime podcast journalists who are like the worst people on the planet, like the worst journalists <laughs> on the planet. Like this is not anything like accurate. And I thought this was actually like pretty accurate, despite the fact they get amazing sound quality off of like the worst recording situation oh, yeah, in an elevator. <laughs> yeah, just, it's like you're going to get some humming in there. Yeah. He just like walking around with it's not even like a zoom. It's it's like something really, really obvious. Like it's a phone most of the time. He's just yeah. like recording voice memos on his phone and completely unsound dead in spaces and getting a media auto quality. I'm like, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, speaking uh going back to Selena for a quick second mm -hmm. and, and talking about her like dry humor, I think in 2021, I don't think Martin Short style of comedy works anymore, but because he's paired with like such a dry character, oh, okay, he's playing such a low status character now, and that's he, yes. why it works. I I I love him. I've always loved him. Me too. I think he's absolutely fantastic. Him and Steve Martin, they're such an amazing pair. They are, and you know, again, I think if I recall, Steve Martin was one of the writers on this. I think so, and. Given that, I was like, ooh, could this maybe just be like a little bit out of touch? And it didn't feel that way. It actually felt like very much kind of in touch with what's going on. And for me, Martin Short, like, it's just so funny. I think the funniest line for me in the entire show is the episode with Sting. Like, Sting playing <laughs> himself, also living in the building, and he's staying in the elevator with his dog. He's like, no, no, don't stand so close to Sting. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> my God. <laughs> it's it's so brilliant. Yeah, I mean, they're both great. But I, I don't think they could do this show without Selena. Like, I don't think it, it would have hit nearly as big of... Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think they it's the trio of them that really makes it work mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And it's its great to see all of them coming back, because I haven't yeah. seen any of them acting in, in much in oh, a yeah. while. Yeah, same. It's got a really good supporting cast, too, and it, it's, it's short. It's, what, 10 episodes? Yeah. 10, 30-minute episodes, really easy to get through. Yeah, season two has already been announced, which is also a great... Yeah. Uh, a great plus. Um, Super cute. Came out of nowhere. Absolutely loved it. Um, all right, so that was your number four. Yeah, what's your number four? My number four was the uh, third and final season of Lost in Space on Ooh, Netflix. That's very you. It is very me, and look, like, it it is very me. And the reason it it got such high placement for me at the end of the day was that it really stuck the landing, which is hard to do. And this is not a pun on the fact they fly around a spaceship that constantly lands and takes off. They stuck the landing of the finale, which is a very hard thing to do. And I I found this season like. It looks gorgeous. It was really emotional. Like, mm -hmm. this is a show that I actually think has done a really good job hitting emotional beats that hit very sincerely. Like, it actually gets me to, like, kind of tear up a little bit. That happened multiple times throughout this season, um, just the emotional impact of all of it. And the fact that the story found a conclusion that didn't feel contrived is really impressive. Not, like I said, not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, I, I almost put another thing on my top five just because it sucked the landing. Mm -hmm. It's because that's so rare nowadays. No, it, it really is. And I think so many shows, you, you fall in love with them, and then they get to the end, and you're like, well, that was fine, I guess. And um, I, I think that this now, these three seasons just stand as like this one kind of long, ongoing story that's really, really fantastic and emotional and has a really nice arc for everyone at the end of the day. Uh, I highly recommend watching the whole thing, especially now that it's done mm -hmm. just go watch them all yeah you you've been plugging this show since season one it's great look i grew up watching the old 60s tv show i'm probably one of the few people on the planet that has a soft spot for the really shitty 98 <laughs> movie just because i was like nine years old when it right. came out it was perfect timing <laughs> it was perfect timing but there's things i like about that nonetheless i just think it's a great concept and i think netflix found a really fantastic way to bring that back around and make it work and make it feel modern and distinct and still bring in a lot of those elements of the old show without it feeling hokey which that show in the 60s was really 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 hokey a lot of the time so got it really great mm. there's, a, there's a, a slight tangent i was going to talk to you about this before we started recording but i yeah. want to bring it up just really quick how dare you? you i know uh i think i've brought this show up before but it's a youtube show uh where they have professional like um visual effects artists and stunt oh, performers come out and I think I've seen this, yeah. review uh, mm -hmm. stunt work. Yeah. They just posted an episode, I think this morning, uh, with Adam Savage talking about uh, the VFX of Star Trek and Star Wars. Ooh, that would be cool. Uh, and it, because Adam Savage worked at... at um, ILM. ILM, yeah. yeah, which worked on both of the movies. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, like, they were all in the same room. Like, they'd share a table 
one side would be the Star Trek designers and then yeah. the other side would be the Star Wars designers. They'd be talking about like what it takes to make the different ships, mm-hmm. and it it's you would love it. Okay, like. I'm gonna it's check that out. Very much your realm. Yeah, I'm definitely you're a fan out. of both. I do. I, I love. I love me some Star, mm-hmm. some Star Trek, some Star Wars, some stars in space. Yeah, I honestly like. At the end of the day, I'm just a sucker for really good sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Battlestar Galactica. That reboot was fucking amazing. Probably some of the best shows I've ever seen in my entire life. I really loved Lost in Space. You know, it's just it just hits me, hits me every time. Yeah, but yeah that sounds awesome. I'll definitely check that out. It's mm-hmm. great. Um, okay, what was your number three? My show? number three is Invincible. Okay, that made it an honorable mention. So okay. let's go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, so. uh, Invincible. I th- I think there's a, a lot you can say and kind of critique about the animation. It's mm-hmm. a little um, shorthanded. Th- there's, this is sort of a new animation style that I'm seeing pop up in other places as well. Um, I think about superman man of tomorrow one of the newer dc animated movies Mm -hmm. i felt had a similar kind of animation style which is like simplistic how would you describe the animation style on yeah it's it's weird so what i think is happening is american animation studios are understanding where japanese animation studios are learning to cut costs Mm. because the japanese animation it's very much the same it's you have a still foreground st- you have a still background you have very minimal foreground uh and then it's just kind of the mouth and the face moving for okay. most of the shots okay sure but where the two differ is american studios kind of just use that as a uh, across the board cutting cost uh so the whole episode is a little cheaper whereas in japanese studios they're basically cutting costs on the long scene so the short high action scenes they can throw all the money at that makes sense. It's something called Sakuga, okay. which is where like every frame is hand animated. You mm-hmm. have like one artist working on this entire sequence. And it's just, you know, that's when you have the explosions, the people running around and going through all these different like camera lens changes and these different perspectives. Uh, it's much cooler there than it is here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah. Th- I think the animation style leaves something d- desired a little bit, but I still found it effective, though. Yeah, for it, the show for a comic because it it's so perfectly uh, copies the style from the comic, right? And so I think you know it's it's an A plus digital comic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. Mm-hmm. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, uh, with you know actual animated fight scenes. Yeah, and I would say too that the um, the voice performances in that yes. are exceptional. Was, absolutely, they that's where all the money went was the yeah. voice talent. And and I think I think that was a smart call on their part if they were kind of hedging their bets i think investing in the talent ultimately was the bigger payoff than investing in the animation which I, th- I think there's a little bit left to be desired in the animation but nothing at all to be left desired in terms of the voice performances right. which are just great across. bald mustachio jk simmons i mean look if you can cast jk simmons <laughs> you cast jk simmons. i guess he has hair in this one just mustachio jk simmons. mustachio always mustachio but like you mean stephen yoon's fantastic in mm-hmm. this like sandra the, oh sandra oh yeah the whole the seth whole... rogan <laughs> seth rogan i mean yeah seth rogan's great jason manzoukas is yeah. great like, oh man yeah the whole supporting cast is phenomenal and those characterizations really popped for me on screen like i I really was invested in that world and those characters and the story they were telling did you read the comic beforehand i haven't read it yet still okay i i read maybe two issues past where the show ended okay or where season one ended i assume we're gonna get a season two at some point i think so i don't remember confirmation one way or the other yeah they haven't i don't think they've announced anything yet i feel like it was a pretty big hit for for amazon when it came out right yeah i hope so yeah i loved it yeah uh, clearly, to my top five. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, it, 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 a very competitive year. Yeah, it, it, very competitive year. Yeah, it ended up. I would say it's probably the top of my honorable mentions. Mm-hmm. Like it all, it, it just got eked out. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, because there's a lot to talk about this year. <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you haven't seen Invincible, we we're kind of we're not really talking about the plot, which is which is good. You should go into this as clean as you can. I would agree with that. Yeah, the the less you know, the better. Mm-hmm. better to be surprised as you go along yeah and it's great it is it's it, so good it's so much fun I, that's a show that i was really excited every week for the new episode to come out yeah mm. i hope we get more yeah i really hope we get more uh what's your number two uh no my number three. Oh, sorry your number three is sex education season three there we go so let's get into it all right so uh what about it really stood out for you i mean just being with these characters again is so great yeah um 
I think this one, you know, we've talked about season one and season two. While being modern shows, they're very much like 80s aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one, I really felt the modern fight going on with like, you know, it's conversation. I, I modern being like, I remember having these conversations when I was in high school. Okay. Of you know the uniform versus no. I mean, I went to a school with uniforms. Right. You, yeah. No. Okay. No, I, I I went to a a public school that was basically essentially a private school because of like like <laughs> because of like property taxes in the yeah, area yeah, yeah. basically. So. Uh, but like I remember talking with my public school friends, be like, oh no, uniforms are great. Like you don't have to think about it. You yeah. know, everyone wears the same thing. Um, you know, our our quote unquote form of creative expression was our ties, which was horrible. And, you know, some of us lived through it like I did. Look, I can relate. That was my form of creative expression when I was working at the agency. Exactly. It was, you know, I had to wear a full suit every day. So it was, okay, how can I color coordinate my ties to my socks and really have it pop every single day? Mm -hmm. So I get it. Um, but no, I, I do think this season, I, I think it was missing something the other two seasons had. And I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it's still just, it's still so good. Yeah. It's so warm. What, what about you? What, what did you love about this season? I mean, I, a lot of the same reasons. I always love returning to this world and these characters. And, and the show is also just so well made. It's so well written. The performances are exceptional. Always a great soundtrack. Just every, every single season. Just, you know, uh, just bumpers all the way through. Um, I think some of the character arcs this season had particular emotional relevance for me. Um, particularly like, um, Otis's story with who's the super hot girl. What's her name? Oh, the popular girl. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. I feel bad. Not Rose. No, no, I feel, um, feel bad. Not remembering her name, but his arc with her had for me in my own personal life this year, some, some resonance. And so it was like kind of the show that I didn't, no, I needed until I was watching it. I was like, oh, I kind of needed this right now. So it it just landed in a way that Ruby, Ruby, you were very close. Um, yeah, his story with Ruby just landed in a way that other seasons hadn't because it felt that much more personal. Um, but I mean, my own personal connection aside, it was just great storytelling mm -hmm. all the way through. And like, I. I actually kind of felt like, without going into specifics of what happened, I felt like it kind of ended in a way that I would have been really happy with the show, with with one exception, with one plot thread exception. The uh, former principal? The mom. Oh, uh, uh, Otis's mom? Yes. Okay. With the exception of a button at the end on her story, everything else to me felt like actually the right place to end mm -hmm. this. And I guess we are getting... In, a fourth season, but it's like one of those things like they, they're not sure most likely what happened. I don't know. Um, I think it's a show that's kind of written to like, Oh, right. Okay. Now I remember yeah. the ending. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a show that's might wrap up every season in a way to be the finale, just in case they don't come back around. Yeah. I, I know some shows that have done that in the past. So I, I kind of would have been happy with an ending here. But that being said, if we are getting more, I'm never going to complain about getting more. Right. Yeah. I, it's, I'm i same. I, I'm happy where everyone ended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just so sweet. It is. Ah, it's just so good. Okay. What's your number two? Uh, my number two is one that I know is not on your list because I've been <laughs> hounding you for weeks to watch this show. <clears throat> okay. uh, my number two is Arcane. I know. I need to sit down and watch it. I almost sat down last night to start it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I think, but I will. I will watch it. I think once you start the first episode, you'll understand, and you'll. It's it's nine episodes. I think yeah. you'll just blast through it once you start it. And I fully expect to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah, it is. I, you know, I've talked about it ad nauseum. It's the most beautiful show I've seen this year. Yeah. Maybe the most beautiful American animation. I mean, it's not even American animation. Maybe yeah. the most beautiful animated series I've seen in my life. Yeah. I I have not talked to a single person who's watched it hasn't loved it. Yeah. everyone seems to love it which is crazy considering it's adapted from league of legends which i, I, I know. know nothing about and everyone i talk to who loves it doesn't know anything about league of legends and still loves this at show. this point i think it's probably better if you don't know anything about the show i can see that because yeah. i'm watching it every character in foreground and background i'm like is that no is that <laughs> no it's not but yeah. is that yeah. no? Like <laughs> I think because you know League has a hundred and twenty something champions now. I haven't something, played I it in three know. years. I've never played it, so I don't know. It's good. Don't. 
you know, it, it, <laughs> it took nine years of my life. Like, you I know, know yeah, I, we, I talk we, about it like an addiction because it was. I know. I, I can see you like scratching the back of your neck right now and like starting to twitch a little bit just I thinking have, about it. No, I, I have dreams about League still. <laughs> like, I'll still see matches in my head. It's bad. Oh, God, I love that so much. Um, but yeah, I, I'm so happy this show is is good, not just for players. Yeah. Um, Because then like the community has always joked for years, like the best thing about League isn't the game. It's the other content they've been putting out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the franchise has four in-game bans now. Uh, Two of them being, uh, one of them being a wildly successful K-pop band called KDA. Okay. Uh, They're incredible. Uh, I don't want to, I think Imagine Dragons is probably already pretty big. But their biggest song from like 2016 was the theme song for Worlds, like the 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 finals of League of Legends. What was the song? Uh, Warriors. Oh, okay, I don't even know Warriors. Uh, weirdly enough, you, you you probably heard it in the background in places. Yeah. Um, but like that like kind of th- like shot their symbol to an international level. Yeah. Um, there's a band called uh, Pentakill, which is like a metal band, which is great. My God. Um. Oh, there's there's two others I can't remember right now, but like they are so good at just making all this other stuff to get people into this very toxic game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta you gotta lure them in, you gotta hook them. Yeah, and so I'm I'm happy because like I I miss playing it every now and then. I I remember how bad I it is it. for me. Yeah, uh, but I miss it, and so having something else I can watch to kind of f- fill that like. Books. I know nine years. Yeah, it's a third of my life I spent playing this game. I know, right? Um, it's it's nice to have something else I can latch onto into this world. Yeah, and again, it's incredible storytelling. Yeah, I need to watch it's it. Shakespearean. I, I'll I'll probably end up watching it um at some point over the holidays. Just mm-hmm. a little bit of downtime. I'll sit down and and, and watch it. So. Yes, I'm very excited for you. Yeah, it's it's one of those weird ones where like it's a show that I simultaneously want to watch slash I kind of need to watch it for work. And this is as dumb as this sounds, because I know I need to watch it for work. There's a part of me that goes like, mm. yeah, you're gonna look at it through critical lens instead of just enjoy a little it. bit. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure I'm still going to enjoy it from everything I've heard about it. And you I, know, and, and like me having to watch stuff for work is like the lowest stakes thing <laughs> possible. I'm not the one who has to talk about it, so what does it matter what I think about right. it? I mean, that's how so. I feel about some of the the episodes we watch. Yeah, is like if I didn't have to take notes, I feel like I'd enjoy this so much more. Exactly. Yeah, it's when you have to approach it from a critical lens, all of a sudden it, sh- it shifts your perspective. But I can just be like. Eh, once you're me talk about it, so what the fuck does it matter? Yeah, I thought you were going to say you're afraid of watching it just because you enjoy spiting me of not watching it. There is an element of that that yeah. is a little bit satisfying. <laughs> so, <laughs> I really love that I can literally do nothing and make you mad. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's incredible, the power you it's hold. It's a very specific joy <laughs> that I don't like to let go of when I have it. It's fair. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I will definitely watch it. Um, my number two this year was Succession Season 3. Mm-hmm. That's funny, because I think both <sighs> of us, when we talked about this beforehand, we both said these were both going to be our number ones. I said Arcane was going to be my number oh, one. Oh, yeah, we, I, we I, said it was, I said it was likely going to be Succession. I, I just, look, again, that's a show that I started watching for work. I've never seen before. And I was like, okay. Like, I literally watched, like, three episodes in a row back-to-back on a plane. Um, and they're like, okay, this is pretty good. I started getting into it and then I got really into it. And then uh, this season, fuck it. It might be the best written show on TV right now. Like wow. I was thinking about it this morning and a comp that I haven't really heard people talk about, but I actually think makes a lot of sense is it's actually a lot like game of Thrones. I mean, for those of you who don't know succession, it's all about a, um, a family very much in the line of like the Murdochs who, control this media empire and it's all like the machinations between them and trying to take control and all the, the politics and their bullshit and their, their drama and trauma and everything else. And it, what reminds me of game of Thrones, it's the, these really flawed characters that are backed by these incredible performances and this just super sharp dialogue that are dealing with, like circumstances where the the actual literal global stakes are pretty high i mean they they help run like the largest media conglomerate in in this fictionalized world but their personal stakes are also so high and they're really great at establishing how that is and like it it's 
it's genuinely mind blowing how compelling this show is. It's like episode to episode. And the fact that they keep throwing in twists and turns that you, you just like, you kind of half expect, but you're still surprised when they actually happen. Um, and it's really sharply written. And it's also, it's very funny, very darkly funny. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Veep in terms of just like mm-hmm. uh, artistry with the word fuck. Like their, their, in, <laughs> their insults are fucking brilliant all the way through. And like, if you've ever just wanted to see a show where Brian Cox, legitimately one of my all-time favorite actors, is just constantly yelling at people to fuck off. It's entirely satisfying. Okay. So. Yeah, I, you know, I have a personal connection with the show. Right. I've been putting it off for a while. Yes. I think with how everyone's talking about season three, I think this will probably be my my holiday show. I'll, I'll start up. It's it's honestly it's worth it. It's 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 so it's so good. Um, and knowing your personal connection, I don't think you'll think of it less. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. I think it's yeah. it's probably far enough removed. I I hear the real life stories of these. In, yes, in my that's true. Life. Yeah, you, that, you. That's why I yeah. stayed away from this. It's like yeah. oh, I know these stories, um, and so I you know I think it'll be nice to also just kind of see the stories I've been hearing for the past ten years played out visually. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. I just don't know what to say other than that. Other than just it, it it's it's a show that I did not think I would like, and I have come to love and crave whenever the new episode is coming around. Like, I'm going to miss it a lot before it comes back around again. Mm -hmm. And it sucks because it's the first time I'm actually really going to have to wait a long time for it. Because I caught up at the end of season two within a few weeks before season three started. And now I'm going to have to wait like a full year or whatever. And it's going to suck. Yeah. (sighs) Well, I think that is a great uh, entry point into my number one. Okay. Which I think might also be your number one. Because we both haven't talked about something very special of of 2021. Yeah, I think it might be the same one here. Uh, Ted Lasso season two. Yep. Ted Lasso made it to my number one spot as well. Same. It's, if you want to talk about a show that like, I am equally happy at the end, but also so upset that I now have to wait another week for more content. I haven't felt this way since like being a kid watching Saturday night cartoons. Yeah. Like cartoon, cartoon Fridays, like Mm -hmm. having the anguish of waiting a whole week for more content. It, it is something very, very special. And and we've talked about, I think a little bit before during this, this year, this season, but it is kind of like sex education for me as well. An empathy generating show, Mm -hmm. which it's funny that I like, this th- and that's honestly the reason why it eats out Succession for me, because um, Succession is not an empathy generating <laughs> show. I mean, it is, but also kind of not. Whereas this is like, you finish watching an episode and you just want to go find a way to be a nice person mm-hmm. anywhere, any way you can. And I love that this season really addressed the idea of like how hard it is actually, what the emotional toll is to be that kind of upbeat positive inspiring person all the time like it, it does come with a cost yeah and i feel like if that was my one maybe critique of the first season is it all felt a little bit too easy and this season's like oh no no it's not easy at all well i think also like when season one came out i think that's exactly what we needed yeah like, we, we both started late we, we yeah i came to it like, about a year late almost i think mm-hmm. yeah yeah i i started about a week before season two premiered okay uh and then immediately benched it all and then was caught up by the time season two started. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't think you were maybe like two weeks after. I think so. Yeah. Um, somewhere around there. But yeah, again, I didn't really have to wait. I just kind of watched it all in one in one big go. Mm-hmm. But it, it is it is so sweet and so charming. And it, it, it's weird because, you know, it, it comes out like Friday at midnight. Um, so I found myself in this bizarre routine of like waking up on Friday morning and going straight to my couch to watching Ted Lasso, which also then meant like I started every Friday morning just by like bawling my eyes mm-hmm. out for like for both heartbreaking reasons and heartwarming reasons simultaneously. Right. Often. But it was just like, what? This is so weird. But like it, it, it it's so emotionally impactful. Yeah. And, and we've also talked about one episode in, in particular, like I think they've made the, the best Christmas episode mm. of any television show. It's a great Christmas episode. I, I'm going to go, once I'm back with my family, I'm going to watch yeah. it again with them. That's a, Thank you for reminding me. I should go do that again as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's, 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 I mean, it got me festive in August. Yeah, when that's it, true. When it came yeah. Out. Oh my God. It really did. It's, it's like, 
I think that episode for me had almost a similar kind of effect that Love Actually does whenever I watched it, but without any of the deeply <laughs> problematic elements that come with watching Love Actually now. Yes. Well, that's why you need to watch The Holiday, because it's, it's, I know, I, it's I will, all the positive feelings there. I will put that into my rotation this year, because you and I were talking uh, off air when we were pretending to be friends, not on this show. Right, right, right. And that... I have just no compulsion to watch all the Christmas movies that I watch every year for some reason. I'm just like tired of all of them. So I need mm-hmm. to find something different. So yeah, that's a good idea. Rewatch Ted Lasso holiday and then watch the holiday. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there's uh, my mom and I both, you know, love television, mm-hmm. but there's not a lot of overlap between our interests in, in media. And I got her to, I got her to start watching sex ed, which was great. Oh. She loved it. She binged all. She's not a binge person. She'll yeah. watch like one episode a day. Yeah. That makes sense. She busy, finished sex so. ed in like a week and a half. Yeah. I, I was so proud of her. <laughs> um, but then Ted Lasso was the same. Like she would call me Friday <laughs> nights or Saturday mornings. Be like, yeah. Cause after the Christmas episode specifically, she called me Saturday morning. She's like, do you want to go to London this Christmas? <laughs> and I'm like, why? It's like, it just looks so pretty in Ted Lasso. And I'm like, yeah, why not? Sure. Uh, the, the, it is getting pushed unfortunately to next year. That makes sense. Um, with Omicron rearing its ugly head. Yes. Yes. Uh, but yeah, like the, the show inspired a family trip to go to London for Christmas. Look, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. It, it's it's masterful just in its writing and its characterization in the storytelling in its use of music just the the emotional beats that it hits like it knows how to like just go straight for your soul with like the simplest gesture mm-hmm. and i have specifics in mind but i won't say them because you know i would rather people experience them for themselves yes um but it, it's just like fucking hell and it's also so funny yeah like genuinely funny like laugh funny. out loud funny yeah because even like everyone is kind of the straight man to jason sudeikis a little bit yeah but because of that like everyone gets like everyone plays it a little bit differently mm-hmm. and they all get to shine yeah every single character and um but brett goldstein in particular mm-hmm. who's also one of the writers on the show is amazing yeah just absolutely amazing in his in his his comedy delivery in his sincerity in his empathy in his eyebrows his, oh those god those eyebrows i mean th- those things make martin scorsese's eyebrows jealous I was like, I was trying uh, I was trying to describe him to a friend who hadn't seen Ted Lasso yet. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, he's the British Eugene Levy, or yeah, the British Dan Levy. Yeah, and he goes, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like he's someone who is not my type at all, but I find myself deeply attracted to just because of how he plays that character. That was the couples costume I saw this year. Was oh, I, Keely yeah. and uh, Roy. Yeah, I could totally see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's oh, it's it's so good. I mean, you and I could go on and on about how good this Forever, show is. But yeah. I mean, it's like, look, I mean... At least until season three starts. Until season three. Look, and, uh, you know, again, lots of amazing TV this year, but I think there's a reason that for both of us, that floated to the top, mm-hmm. um, despite having a lot of really strong competition. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything else like it on TV right now. I agree. I fully agree. I hope more stuff does... I mean, Sex Ed's probably the next closest thing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. shows just, like, being a good person has, you know has benefits has benefits yeah exactly but um it's fantastic do, do you want to run through real quick some of your honorable mentions before we move on to, to film uh i do because i think there's it's something very interesting for both of us neither of us have a marvel series on here yeah they're pretty much all of my uh, my honorable mentions Same. so i'll let you go go through all of yours first and i'll do all of mine yeah because i think mine are, are where my my personality shines a little bit more <laughs> yeah that makes sense so. uh all the marvel shows obviously falcon winter soldier wandavision loki what if they're all so good. Uh, Hawkeye is, is still happening right now. I, if I had a chance to see the finale, which I think is going to be fucking incredible, mm-hmm. it probably would have made it into my top five. It's my top Marvel show so, so far, and I haven't even seen all of it yet. Yeah, it's so. it's so it's so just nice. It's so much better <laughs> than it has any right to be. Like I, I'm not the biggest Hawkeye fan. I think he's fine. I think Jeremy Renner is fine. I think he is so much better in this than he's been in any other part of the MCU. Plus, Haley Steinfeld, who you and I, you especially, <laughs> adore. I've all, I, I think she's amazing. I think she's so fucking good in this. Um, obviously, we're getting a little bit more of Florence Pugh now. Mm-hmm. Like, she's incredible. 
We're seeing a slight, without going into details, we're seeing a slight expansion into the rest of the Marvel Universe as mm-hmm. part of this show in a very exciting way. It's super cute and super Christmassy. Um, Tony Dalton, who plays Jack Duquesne, is like... He's the, so much fun. The perfect kind of smarmy. Yeah. Like, I want to hate him, and I cannot because he is undeniably charming. He's he's the mustache-twiddling villain. Who's maybe who's not even a, a villain. Who's a stepfather. Yes. <laughs> who's, like, reading books about how to be a good stepfather. There is such a cute moment. I think it... I want to say it was episode three maybe three or four we're like with a, not a super spoiler here but like kate bishop Haley Seinfeld's character is like really distrusted jack all the way through and there's this really cute moment where like she and jack and the mom who brilliantly played by vera formiga who's like one of the greatest actresses working right now <laughs> like they had this really cute moment where like they kind of bond together as a family and you can see kate start to like jack and it's just like the performances in that moment are so good and it's such it could be such a throwaway moment, but it's one of the most emotionally impactful in the whole thing. And it's it's just... Also, fucking Linda Carlini is in this. She is. In like 30 seconds an episode, every time you're on <laughs> screen, you're like... I just there love, she is. I love you so much, Linda Carlini. <laughs> like, I know. I wish I wish we got more of her. I hope we see a bit more of her in the finale. I, I, I think there are pieces falling into place to m- give her a slightly larger role. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. I mean, like... I, we took it went on a whole Hawkeye tangent yeah. there, but I, we had to talk about it at yeah. some point. I, I'm I'm crazy crazy excited for the finale. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, I cannot wait. Uh, yes, yeah, so I had all the Marvel shows. Uh, Mythic Quest season two. Mm, yeah, I you think, said it's really good. Yeah, yeah. I feel the way I feel about it. I think is a very similar way to how you feel about Succession, mm-hmm. where it's a show where all the characters are a little grimy and a little rough. Oh, okay, sure, but you like uh, you kind of like them nonetheless. But but it just lands the finale so, where I I think. I hope we don't get anything after this. I think okay. it, it lands it so perfectly. I don't want any more. Okay. Uh, and then my my weird honorable mention, just because like it's a show I started watching as a background show, and I'm like, wait, this is like weirdly happy and charming, and everyone's mm-hmm. really nice in this. Young Rock. Oh, okay. I can see that. Yeah, the, the Rock, Dwayne, Dwayne the Man Johnson. As everyone calls him. <laughs> what? Dwayne the Man Rock. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, He's only in it for like like three minutes an episode, which I think is great. I think he needs to get out of the way because yeah. everyone else in the show is so is so not. Ni- it it follows three parallel storylines where it's right. him uh, in middle school, him in high school, and him in college, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe elementary school. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, but each are very different phases of his life, and he, you can see how each one affects the other. You know, when he's a kid, it mostly revolves around his relationship with his dad. And how his dad is so work focused, like, you know, it's it's that kind of partnership. When he's in high school, it's much more of like his public image of, you know, he wants to be the popular kid, but he's not because his family isn't well off. Uh, and then when he's in college, it's much more like sports focused. Like this is his time to make his family proud. Mm-hmm. Like he's going to be the athlete. And if you know anything about Dwayne the Man Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> this new nickname you created for him despite um, him having one of the most famous nicknames <laughs> in the entire world but by all means cameron please continue uh, uh he he was a near professional football player in, right until a horrible injury yeah uh and so it follows that storyline uh and it, it's just a really it's really well told okay i look i could see that i think i feel like the persona around the rock especially now at this point is maybe greater than the man himself. I, I find that like his charm is less effective as time goes on. I think as he takes himself more and more seriously, I agree. Um, I find him a little bit less compelling and charming. And I feel like he's maybe kind of getting lost into his own mythos a little bit. So the idea of the show itself feels very, Oh, in, in how each egocentric is. and like, like hagiographic, but so how each episode is set up, which which plays exactly into that problem, yeah. is it's him running for 2024 president. And that's exactly why I'm very uh, skeptical. And each episode is like a parable he's telling to a question that one of the reporters is asking him. Yeah. And it's like, how have you ever dealt with loss? He's like, oh, let me tell you a story about my yeah. father and me. Yeah. And I'm, then it gets into the actual story. I mean, it. I feel like that show is going to become a prequel to the real world recreation of idiocracy. 
where a professional wrestler is the president of the United States. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's going to get a season two. Okay. Uh, I'd be fine if it didn't. I think the episodes that we have are great, mm-hmm. uh, but I'd be happy if it got more. Okay. That's fair. Mm-hmm. I don't know how popular it was. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I know of it, but I've never, never watched it. Yeah. So. And that's fair. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. What's your short So list? some of my honorable mentions are going to be familiar titles that you've heard me plug before, but um, Masters of the Universe, Rev- like Revelation. Mm-hmm. Which, again, for me, not being a He-Man fan at all, I found that show really, like, gorgeous and fun and compelling and incredible voice performances all throughout. It's got a fucking bumping Bear McCreary score, (laughs) which is definitely a a bonus on my part. But, like, you know, especially now that all of it's out on Netflix, all ten parts, and they're, they're like, half hour each. I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And I, I think, you know, if... If you love the Tim verse, it's worth watching because it, it does a lot of the same things we love about that universe. Um, yeah, like uh, the Marvel stuff, I think WandaVision was close to being up there for me, but I didn't love the finale, which, kind of, which kind of bumped it out of the top five. Um, same with Loki. I was like, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Um, the other honorable mentions were uh, like the two Star Wars shows this year. So Bad Batch. Which... Bad Batch was so good. I forgot to put that down. That's uh, in my honorable mentions. Yeah, it... it it's a show that at first I was like, ah, it feels a little bit like it's just cribbing pieces of Rebels and Clone Wars and the Mandalorian, and it's not something unique. And about, what, it's like a quarter into the first season, it really found its groove, and it was a show that week to week just kept delivering great Star Wars. And and knowing what makes Star Wars so compelling, which is this incredible world, these incredible characters, this huge scale, the spectacle – um, but never losing track of the heart. It's a really heartfelt show. And I, I thought it was brilliant. I'm super, super excited for the next season. Um, and then also Star Wars Visions. It's beautiful. Which I, I would say that overall, a lot of it's kind of forgettable, but there are like three or four in there. Like I think of like Ronin. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones. Like the Ninth Jedi, I think was one of the other ones. Mm-hmm. that was super good. Um, but I remember you and I sat down to watch like, the first couple episodes together and Ronin, the very first one in particular. Oh, it's, it's award winning. It, it is going to win everything. It's gorgeous. And it, I am like famously not an anime person, <laughs> like f- famously not an anime person. And I was watching this going like, this is what I want more from Star Wars. I want something that feels totally unique and beautiful and self-referential without ever feeling repetitive Mm -hmm. and it's it's great i I don't i don't think you there's definitely some like missable skippable ones in there but certainly ronin the ninth jedi uh, i'm trying to blank on some of the other ones oh the village bride i remember being really good as well Mm -hmm. um oh sorry it's not called ronin it's called the duel is the very first episode ronin's ronin's the name of the book the book i haven't read which i do want to read at some point Mm -hmm. um but yeah that's my last honorable mention i thought it was just fantastic yeah love bad batch i i you know famously i'm not a star wars fan right exactly (laughs) Um, but i have a friend uh kelsey who who loves star wars so much Mm -hmm. um that like she has she has made me watch more of the other world like we start like i finished clone wars because she pushed it so much yeah i started rebel i think i no i didn't finish rebels almost finished rebels because she pushed it so much um and so having someone like that watch like to watch Bad Batch with, yeah, where like every episode is you know a world you know a new world for her, yeah, was like that that made it extra fun for me to watch. I, I think it's and fair. also Alpha is just yeah the best. He, yeah, anytime we get a Kiwi, it makes me happy. Oh, it's so good. Like, look, Dave Filoni is a genius, mm-hmm. and I think he has done more for Star Wars than anyone else outside of George Lucas. And he has in fact been able to make a lot of the less than stellar decisions that George Lucas has made over the years better through his storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, And anything he touches, especially in the star Wars space is fucking brilliant. Yeah. And we're checking out. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that great joke that the internet loves to keep refreshing of the one throwaway line from George Lucas where Grievous and uh, uh, Anakin had never met. Filoni had to write that into six seasons, how they were mortal enemies, but they never actually met each other. Oh yeah. That's right. (laughs) I know it's, it's ridiculous. Um, a lot of great stuff there. All right. Shall we, uh, move on to some films? Yes. Okay. So Cameron, let us, uh, have you start us off here? What is your number five movie of the year? Yeah. You'll see a, a pretty, pretty like 
through line for my top five. Uh, my number five is Encanto. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's you, not, you were not. It's not on mine, so I'll let you go ahead and talk yeah, about that, it. Yeah, that's so. fair. I know yeah. you weren't as warm to it as I was. I thought it was fine. I I loved it. It's it's like this weird addicting soundtrack. Where I when I first listened to it in the movie, I'm like, oh, this is okay. It's, yeah. You know, it it's has weird payoffs for music. Mm-hmm. Um, unexpected payoffs and and notes that I thought were going to happen never they never hit. It, it was it was weird. I had a weird emotion coming out of it. I mean, I mean it's worth acknowledging it's Lin Manuel Miranda doing the music. Who yes. his music style is odd like his songs are unexpected and take weird turns and they don't necessarily hit the beats you expect them to Mm -hmm. and i think sometimes that really works sometimes it it doesn't and i think it's his music is one that is you gain more the more you listen to it like i'm about to you know do a drive back up to norcal and i'm gonna re-listen to the encanto soundtrack and i bet i'm gonna find i love it more the more Mm -hmm. i listen to it the way I, i found i loved hamilton more the more i listen to it yes um, and I've heard similar things to Tick, Tick, Boom, which he mm. also did the music for. Right, yeah. I've heard two or three of the songs, uh, and they're they're incredible. I mean, they're mm-hmm. great songs. Yeah. Uh, but this one is specifically, like, because it also has the Colombian themes tied into it, yeah. um, every song is so unique. And I, I would say these don't feel like Lin Manuel songs. Yeah. I, they don't have the same, agree. like, speed. I, I mean, there is definitely a lot of speed in them, especially the opening song. Um but like it's it's not the same like rhythmic patterns that he does for his other stuff. The, the best comparison I can think of, and I know you haven't seen the Last Night in Soho yet. Just, I've not. You haven't seen Last Night in Soho, but it it reminds me of how I watched that movie and go like, this doesn't feel like an Edgar Wright film, but I can see how his mastery of what he does makes this work. I feel like maybe that's how I would describe the Lin Manuel songs in Encanto. Like they don't feel like what you'd expect from him, but because he's so good at what he does. You can feel that genius mm-hmm. and that energy and that creativity in there, even if it doesn't hit the same sort of pattern that you're used to from him. Yeah. Um, yeah. The movie, like, I don't know. It hit me in a very special way. Yeah. Uh, the, the main theme of the movie is just everyone needs therapy and that's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I did appreciate that part of it. Um, yes. Yeah. And, you know, it talks about kind of generational, uh, generational problems of, you know, how do you, how do you, explain this mm-hmm. to your grandparents well, and generational trauma yeah even too uh yeah it's it's just such a beautiful and obviously the visuals are it's gorgeous un- unparalleled and, it's... And, and great um performances all the mm-hmm. way through as well yeah who's the uh the main actress i never remember uh, her name. stephanie beatrice thank you most famous from brooklyn 99 right yeah um i she plays such a different character and because i only know her from brooklyn 99 right hearing her like emote is yeah. so i i didn't until after my second viewing, I didn't believe it was her <laughs> until I saw interviews of her talking about the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's one that the more I watch it, the more I'm going to appreciate it. I think so, too. I think I'm going to be perfectly honest, Cameron. You may have oversold it for me a little bit. That That is fair. I, I did because <laughs> I'd seen it twice by the time I talked to you about it. I, and I think I'd known you'd seen it a third time because <laughs> of Instagram when I went to go see it this last week. Yeah, um, I, I thought. Yeah, I thought it was cute. I thought it was beautiful. Like, it looks gorgeous. The music's fun, but I found forgettable at the time. Again, I think it's one. The more I revisit it, the more it's going to go up in my esteem. I just found it. OK. Yeah, I think yeah. of the Disney movies this year, Disney Pixar movies this year, I think this is the best of the three. Uh, it's not a Pixar movie. I, I'm grouping them as Disney oh, Pixar okay. because I'm I, sorry. There, there was an implied height, like slash in there yes. that I did no, not. No, I know see. it's not Pixar. Yeah. Yes. Cause I didn't, cause like if I'm not, I'm just comparing it to Raya. And so I'm, yeah. I'm doing between Raya, Luca and Encanto. I think yeah. Encanto is the best of the three. Um, I mean, it's fair. I did watch Luca recently. It was cute. Luca's great. Yeah. yeah it, it was, it's, it's one of the best summer movies of just like, yeah. I want to turn it on and imagine I'm by the beach, but not actually drive the six miles to the beach. Yeah, it was, you know, and like, I mean, for me, of course, I watched it. I was like, you know, I, I will I will I will sniff out like a big rainbow bloodhound, anything that's <laughs> semi queer in it. And like and there were times when it felt like there was kind of a queer thing going on. And, you know, they're just Italian, Chris. They're just Italian. But I don't know. For me, for me, that movie is like call me by your name or I thought it was really. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. It's called by your name light. <laughs> no, no, specifically name or because like the whole oh, plot thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, those aren't gay, Chris. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> pretty gay. Uh, what is your number five? Um, oh, okay. Here's where I have to make a call. Uh, okay. 
my number five is Shang Chi. Okay, it did not make my list. Okay, mm-hmm. um, and I this is I guess a, a slight spoiler. It actually we'll, we'll still talk about the other movie, but it yeah. actually edged out No Way Home for me. Wow. Yes. And we'll get we'll, we'll still talk at length about No Way Home. And yeah. Like I said, we will put spoiler warnings um, right right when we go into that. But I think for me, as broadly speaking as I can, there were some pieces of No Way Home that were absolute mind blowing standouts. I think as a whole, Shang Chi landed a little bit more for me, just in terms of like the pace, the storytelling, the action beats. It felt a little bit more original just because we've had so many Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. And look, I will be fully transparent on this. Part of this is that I have an absolute huge crush on Simu Liu. (laughs) Uh, I was just watching the assembled documentary about making that movie. And I was like, I'm he, I love him. I'm just in love with him. That's Um, fair. I mean, it's, it hurt me to not put it in my top five. Yeah. I, I just, so I've seen that movie, I think, four times this year. Okay, I've only, I've only seen it twice, but I really want to watch it again. I, I just think it's it's what I want to see from Marvel. It, it leans heavily into genre. It's bringing us new characters that are great. I think it has some of the best performances, particularly out of Tony Leung, that we've had out of the entire MCU. It looks gorgeous. It's unexpected in places. It has gorgeous fight choreography, mm-hmm. multiple points along the way through, and it's worth repeating once again simu liu is just so charming so handsome. yeah everyone is great <laughs> aquafina i think this is the best we've I, ever had of aquafina. agreed yeah i i find that she can be grading under certain circumstances i think she's really brilliant in this i agree um, yes yeah, so it was it was ultimately my top marvel movie if only just slightly eking out no way home and with uh black widow a little bit below that and then internal internal is <laughs> floating somewhere below that very very <laughs> far far below that but anyways that was my number five was shang chi okay what is your number four uh my number four was cruella that's great <laughs> i'm happy <laughs> you're make... making the disney list that i wanted to did make. It make your top five it didn't okay look we've talked about this before I'll try to be as brief on this as I possibly can. This is a movie that I expected to hate Mm -hmm. because I don't like villain origins. I, as I've talked about at length, despise Joker. I fucking hate Joker for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Um, But I don't think villain movies work. We're trying to make them sympathetic. I hate those kind of movies. I don't like prequels, generally speaking. And I really haven't liked most of the Disney live action remakes with a few little exceptions here and there, primarily Cinderella. And I found Aladdin mostly pretty fun. But so I'm like, I think I'm going to, I expect you to hate this movie. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. I was shocked, legitimately shocked by how much I enjoyed this movie. It is Emma Stone at easy A level charm and fun, which we have not seen from her in years. But my easy A was 2009. Yeah. And and having just recently rewatched the Spider-Man movies that she's in, I think she was playing in that same kind of space there. She's super fun in those movies. Yeah. Um, But we haven't seen this from her in a long time. Until she's not. Until she's not. Yeah. (laughs) We haven't seen this from her in a long time. She's so charming. The whole supporting cast is absurdly charming. I mean, it's Emma Stone versus Emma Thompson. Who is an amazing villain. Who is, like, I, look, Emma Thompson, in my mind, can do no wrong. She is a goddess, and I think this is her having so much fun. It has, it's it's just gorgeous all the way through. The costumes are fucking incredible. It's, you know, all very, like, 60s, 70s, kind of that energy, that vibe, that sort of poppiness. Brilliant soundtrack. And it's worth noting, it's directed by Craig Gillespie, who did, like, Lars and the Real Girl and I, Tanya. He has this brilliant visual flair that really comes through. And, like, it, it from the most cynical read of what that movie should have been, in contrast to the reality, it's, like, it's, it's fathoms apart. It is just a brilliant ride and i have i i have a hard time imagining anyone watch that and not just have fun yeah with it like it was we watched i watched it for the first time with my whole family um and like all five of us really enjoyed it i don't know if there's ever a time we've all agreed all five of us on a movie as much as we did on this uh it's amazing i i need to rewatch it because i think i just had a bad theater experience okay and that that you know if you have a bad movie theater experience i get it taints the whole movie it does yeah it totally does uh, Unless it's Rise of Skywalker, we just had both. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. 
the the middle of the Venn diagram of bad movie and bad theater going experience, just death fucking center right there. Um, but no, like it was it was the first movie I saw in theaters. Okay, uh, yeah, or like it was, where it was a full theater. Oh, okay. Uh, and like that made me a little iffy. You know, people yeah, were on their fair. phone because they don't like they don't remember theater etiquette. Yeah, or kid. You know, it's a kids movie. I can't be upset if there's kids. Yeah. at a kids movie, but I will be. Yes, I know you will. Um. Yeah, I, I need to rewatch it without those barriers to, yeah. to knock it back. Yeah, cause I, I watched it the first time. We, we ended up doing the premium thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm glad I did because literally like a week later, my sister-in-law is like, hey, like, what's your Disney Plus log? I really want to watch <laughs> Corel again. And I was just like, of course, here you go. I'm just glad you want to rewatch it. And then I did go see it in theaters um, with some friends. And yeah, I it. I, I don't know what to say other than it's fucking great. No, it's, yeah, it's I, so, I agree. It's so much fun. Like, I sh- here's the thing. I should be embarrassed that it's my number four movie of the year, and I am the furthest thing from. Like, I will defend this movie until I die. No, I, I love that. So, I'm happy for you. Yeah, but what was your number four? My number four is, I think, your most anticipated for the season, uh, West Side Story. Oh, that that is one that's on my list of things I have not yet seen that I really want to. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I won't go into a ton of detail yeah um and and i i haven't uh we haven't done the podcast since i've seen it so i haven't talked about it yet um it is beautiful yeah um the way i would describe it because i don't know how else to say it it is a movie made in 1980 that just became remastered oh okay Uh, like it it has i I don't know what it is about the 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 cinematography and the filmmaking of the 80s that like it feels like that Mm -hmm. where it's like the harsh shadows and you know, he, you know, it's, it's Spielberg. It's, it's, I would say it's the best Spielberg movie I've seen in two decades. That's, that's fair. Yeah. That's totally fair. Um, and I had not seen the original one before, mm-hmm. just, just as you. Wait, wait, hang on. Does that include Tintin? Yeah. I'll include Ooh, Tintin. Oh, wow. And I love Tintin. I do too. I think mm-hmm. Tintin's phenomenal. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I think also because it's live action Spielberg. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's very, it's very different. Very yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to be clearly fair. better than BFG. <laughs> Uh, leagues better than Ready Player <laughs> One. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not hard. Uh, Brute Despise, you know, it, it knocks that down a few paces. Yeah, um, yeah. I've heard it's great. Yeah, and the music is incredible. The dancing, oh my god, the dancing. Mm-hmm. I I knew the dancing numbers from the original movie. Okay, but the way these these men and women just fly through the air. Yeah, like it is still the like kind of kind of cringy like dance fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the opening number, <laughs> but the, the the jets versus the sharks, right? Yes, yes. But I I would say like the biggest change they make because I know like there's a lot of issues with the 1960s version because it's made that it's, in the 1960s. It's made in the 1960s, and there's almost like no like actors of color in it, despite <laughs> yes. it being like all about like it's it's mostly like uh, the characters mostly what Puerto Rican, right? In New York, or? yeah, yeah, they're all Puerto Rican. Yeah, and like there's what like one Latino actor. I think it's like just Rita Moreno and then a bunch yeah, of white people. Yeah, so there was an interview I saw <laughs> so... with her where they like even though she was, I think she's Colombian. Yeah, even though she is, you know, of Mexican of of uh, Latinx descent. Yeah. Uh, they still like made her wear darker makeup. Oh my god! To I'm match not, the other I'm, white actors, they were putting in makeup. I'm not even a bit surprised. Yeah, uh, but this one is is much better. Yeah, um, it it has a much more diverse side. I wouldn't even consider them sharks in this movie. I I don't see them as a gang in this version. Okay, it's very much it's the Jets messing with the Puerto Ricans. <laughs> okay, that yeah. sounds that and sounds that's, fair. That's probably the best change you could have made. <laughs> Is it's they're just trying to live their lives, and then the Jets, these asshole white kids, are coming in and just ruining everything. Well, that sounds pretty accurate <laughs> yeah. and accurate. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, you have to kind of get past the Ansel Elgort part. Yeah. He's, he's probably the worst part of the movie, like outside of just his real life problems. Yeah. Uh, but everyone else, uh, Rachel Ziegler. I oh, think yeah, is, yeah, is, like um, the, the lead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. She is gorgeous she's beautiful she's yeah. amazing in this movie um yeah i'm excited for you to watch it because i think yeah. you are gonna well i think this will will make your top five after you see it yeah i i, I want to try and find a time soon to go and see it in a theater because I'm, I'm really really intrigued by that one yeah the the second number where they're in the school dance mm-hmm. that one specifically yeah. like these i don't know how you can jump that high <laughs> and just like do do things in the air like that they're flying I mean, you know how much I love a musical. Oh, that is so. the theme of... I'm, I'm two for two musicals so far. That's true. Actually, I'm, I'm zero. <laughs> I almost like... I mean, it's not a musical, but like the music in Corel is one of the biggest parts yeah. of that. I almost kind of count it, but it's, yeah. But <laughs> uh, 
Okay, what is your number three? My number three is Dune. That's my number three. Really? Oh, <laughs> fuck, yeah. Look, um, it's brilliant. You have the book on your shelf. It's right next I'm, to me at I'm, the moment. I'm, I've been reading that book <laughs> since <laughs> months. September. <laughs> And I'm determined to finish it. I keep reading other things in the middle of it. Like yeah. I'm simultaneously reading that as I'm reading like the DC Super Sons omnibus. <laughs> like I need a break sometimes from Dune. The further in the book you get, the better it gets. It's very slow to start with. But like I went in having read about a quarter of the book, which has maybe helped a little bit in some of the context. But that movie, like, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. The performances are incredible. It's it's slow and methodical, but for me, Denny Villeneuve, that's what he does so well. I mean, that's how I felt about Blade Runner 2049 as well. It's just like, it's slow, it's taking its time, but there's this background building of tension. And because it's slow, you are allowed to kind of like soak in this world and these characters. And it, I mean, it's a great story, but, uh, you know, as I was having a hard time getting to the book at certain points, just because it like the book is really slow. And the movie was very judicious in how it like picked the key things to focus on. Would the book be better if you had those electric bagpipes playing in the background? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, also like House Arrakis I theme mean, is uh, talk about rocks. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, again, me being like the score hound that I am. Like Hans Zimmer's score, oh, great fucking year for Hans Zimmer. I mean, not, yeah. that he, not that he has many bad years. To be fair, he's doing fine. But it's, I mean, yeah, like the space bagpipes. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Like it, it to me, this is the movie. I think maybe more so than anything else that defined big screen epic. Yes, this year. Like I'm so glad I saw it in a theater. Um, it was it wasn't an IMAX yet. I really wish I had seen it in IMAX. I just did not have time. But I did get to see it at a pretty big screen nonetheless, and I was blown away by mm -hmm. it i mean what what about it for you made it top three? Oh man it's for very similar reasons like you you're a much bigger sci-fi person than i am i'm, I'm a big sci-fi slut yeah and yeah. that that's great i i will see bad sci-fi you know i've watched Cameron, you'll see bad everything, bad everything. Full everything. stop that's true <laughs> So. You know, I I watched Valerian, yeah. uh, and I wasn't too ha super happy with it. <laughs> uh, but I feel like we haven't had a good, you know. Obviously, Avatar is I I'm a defender of of James Cameron's Avatar. The one, the well, the yeah. two. It's you and James Cameron. <laughs> yeah, so. it's the Camerons. <laughs> Dude, um, touche. To to a problematic level. Yes. Um, where like seeing and and I this year I did I did um. The I finally was on Ideal Remake with, with uh, our yes, friend Sam, yes. where oh, we talked about Avatar mm -hmm. and seeing Dune, Dune, Dune. Um, it it opened my eyes of like, oh, this is what a good sci-fi epic is. And I texted you right after, and I texted Sam right after, and I'm yeah. like, oh, this is this is the this is the Avatar that I wanted. Yeah, it, it's ah, it's brilliant. It's just so good. I'm so glad a part two got greenlit. Because it took, like, the Tuesday after mm -hmm. it came out for them to finally do it. I would have been so mad if it didn't happen. Because if there's the one caveat I always tell people is that it ends at an unexpected point because it's only half the story. But that being said, like, what they do give us in that first movie, it's, it's just breathtaking. Yeah. And I'm usually... I'm weirdly jaded. I don't think I'm weirdly. I think I'm accurately jaded when I see part one yeah. in movies. Yeah. Like even when we got the Spider-Verse trailer, Spider-Verse 2 trailer, yeah. mm. and it tagged on the part one at the end, that ruined the trailer for me. Yeah, I know. Uh, but no, I think, the, and you you gave me the warning ahead of time. Yeah. It's the um, one thing I was telling people going in. Just like be prepared, odd ending, but it's brilliant. Yeah. I think the ending works. I think. I think it does um, mostly. Yeah. It, it like, you know, it, it's like a good book ending. Yeah. You know, I'm excited. I'm happy with where everything is. And I'm excited for where they go. Yeah, same. And, and I mean, it, talk about a stacked cast. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's an argument. I think we talked about this when we reviewed it earlier in the podcast. That like, there's an argument to be made that a, a HBO miniseries, or like an Apple TV miniseries, may have been a better structure for the story. I think the problem is, if you do that, you miss out on Denis Villeneuve and what he brings to it, which honestly, like, he makes this. I think without him, this does not work. I agree. I think with you, if you go to TV, you don't get this cast. I mean, it's like 
you don't like, get this budget. You don't get this budget. And like, and, and the thing is, the money's on screen. Yeah, and that I was going to say that that is your big point, and that is what I've been telling everyone. Yeah, the money is absolutely on screen, and the performances are fantastic. I mean, my God, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya for like five minutes, but like, <laughs> I mean, Oscar Isaac, Rachel, um, um, Rebecca Ferguson, mm-hmm. Duncan Idaho. So look, this, this like this is maybe the best. Um, Jason Momoa performance yeah. we've ever gotten. I, I'm like, I love or him because he's just playing himself. He's just playing Surfer Bro, and it works somehow in this Space movie. Surfer Bro, yeah, and like fucking Josh Brolin's in there, like you know, uh, Stellan Skarsgård. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. God, <laughs> Stellan Skarsgård. Skarsgård. Oh, poor man. It's. I, Thank God we only see him in shadow. I know. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle seeing him in, fucking, in the light. It's fucking grotesque. But yeah, it's um, it's amazing. I mean, it. it 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 my it was a very competitive year when it got to the very top of the films and and that had to make it into there somewhere yeah um but it, it was like there were basically three my top three were all kind of like shifting back and forth a little bit um i think there's a world where like i might say this is the best movie that i saw this year if not necessarily my favorite so okay yeah the, oh yeah so i made this as my favorite list clearly yeah same that's yeah. how i approached it as well yeah mm-hmm. uh um, so yeah, i'm very was... curious where your number two and one are now. okay so then um my number two is the harder they fall. Oh, you you have recently told me about this. Yes, one. it's uh, it's on Netflix, and it's the the director of the view of this this filmmaker James Samuel, and it's a western. And because I don't want to not do anyone justice, I have literally brought up the IMDb so I can give you the full cast list. Yes, here I, I go. If you want to talk about a stacked cast. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Majors, who the genre fans that usually listen to this show would know as he who remains the very end of Loki. Um, he he's also in Love Calf Country, which I'm not seeing, yeah. but like he's great in that. He like this movie for me, I was like, proved like this, like this is one of those actors that shows up and is a ready made star. Mm-hmm. Like he is He's the next Henry Golding. Oh, but like can, can, <laughs> but can out act henry golding <laughs> yeah. not, i mean i love henry golding yeah to be fair made the best actor but like he is he's charismatic he's charming he, his he carries so much emotion and power just in his face all the time he, he's a thespian he is like and he, he yeah he is like he's an actor yeah but deserves <laughs> to be referred to as such so he's fucking amazing so it's him it's uh it's zazzy beats it's idris elba it's um, R.J. Uh, Kyler Seiler, who was Billy in the Power Rangers reboot, a movie that you and yep. I have plenty of time for. Mm-hmm. Um, Regina King, Lakeith Stanfield. I think I've already mentioned Idris Elba, maybe. We can say him again. It's, you, you can say his name as many <laughs> times as we want. Maybe we say it three times, he'll appear. I'll be very yeah. happy about that. Uh, like, this is one of the best ensemble casts I've ever seen, but also, like, such a, a confident directorial debut from someone like this movie has so much style like i, I i'm trying to think of a, a, a good comp might be tarantino but i also feel like that's not doing it justice it's it's its own thing like and it the music has this very kind of like reggae inspired soundtrack to it as well so it has these like almost slightly anachronistic elements to it in just terms of like some of the dialogue and some of the music, but it feels totally at place in this world, which is gorgeous and fun and effervescent and Oh, good word. Yeah. Right. I I was, I was blown away by this. I did watch it at home with my family. They were like, yeah, we kind of liked it. I, I loved it. I mean, it, it beat out almost everything else this year for me. (laughs) Uh, it's it's brilliant. I mean, I I hope it gets award recognition. I think it's absolutely deserving of it. I would be surprised if it won Best Picture because they usually go for stuff that's more serious. And at the end of the day, like it's a western, so it's a genre film. Which there and it's not, a Netflix film. It's a Netflix film. I'm not super keen on, but it's it's brilliant. I cannot recommend this enough. It it's so much fun, but it has so much just palpable emotional energy at its core, and the performances are. Ama- like they the actors in this are so good they make it look so easy but you can just see also i, I have a hard time with actors who i can feel like they're trying way too hard this is the reason why i really don't like amy adams in particular i feel like she's always just trying to win an oscar and i can tell everyone here is making this look effortless but you can also tell how much work they're doing and it's oh god it's it's fucking brilliant that's great yeah i'll, I'll probably watch it once the holiday season's over yeah yeah so now I've, I've too many other movies to watch yeah. i mean look it's 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 kind of in, it's fun, but it's also kind of intense. Yeah, and it, it's pretty graphically violent at times, um, but also has some of like the 
it 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 has it hits some of those classic western action beats you expect like it's got the big shootout in the town and stuff like that but it feels original it feels fresh in how it does it yeah it's so good i need to go watch it again my god what uh what was your number two this uh, year my number two, so we can finally talk about it, is <laughs> Spider-Man. All right. Okay. So then... And I, I will say, I am very fresh off Spider-Man. I, yes. I've watched it within 48 hours. Um, I'm still processing. Yes. I, I I did go see it a second time yesterday, mm-hmm. knowing we'd be talking about it. And so, worth noting, we're probably going to get into spoilers, because this is the only chance we're going to have to talk about this movie on the podcast. There are timestamps down the show notes. So, if you want to jump ahead and avoid spoilers, you can't let let's try can we do real quickly like weekly planet style like a spoiler free just quick thing like why it was so good for you before we get into full spoilers for people yes oh man how do i talk about this without spoilers um <laughs> how about you go first okay <laughs> okay so and I, i'm what i will say about and it, it, it did not make my top five ultimately it mm-hmm. was between shang chi and this i was literally debating right up until we recorded and it ultimately went to shang chi because like i said there are pieces of this movie that are incredible. Like yes. I had high expectations going in. It exceeded them. Agreed. Same. Agreed. Um, it's, I would say one of maybe, maybe the most emotionally impactful Spider-Man movie. I like here. I'm going to caveat this. I still think in the Spider-Verse, the best Spider-Man movie ever made. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Still think that. Mm hmm. So they're, they're on such different levels. They're on, yeah. So when I refer to the other Spider-Man movies, I'm referring to the seven previous live action movies, all of which I just rewatched. <laughs> yes. So I think this is probably the best. I, I would agree. Of all of them. Um, I, I am stealing this from, from some colleagues, but I think this is maybe the most Spider-Man Spider-Man movie we've had ever, or at least certainly in a very long time. Fully agree. Um, I think it really understands who he is as a character. I think it goes out of its way to what distinguish what makes this interpretation of Spider-Man different than previous iterations we've seen before. Um, uh, I think it, it delivered so many things that I was hoping it would and did it better than I was hoping for. Um, I think it's exemplary even amongst the, again, Shang-Chi for me was, I personally prefer more than this. I think this is the best MCU movie to come out this year. I would say it's probably one of the best overall. I, I think so too with, with how I'm still processing it. It, it's probably top three. Yeah. It's, it, it's truly, truly exceptional. It This movie in West Side Story reminded me, because like we've talked about this a few times on the podcast. I'm specifically seeking out movies that make me happy. Yeah. Um, and seeing West Side Story, it reminded me like, oh, even if they make me sad, that doesn't mean they're bad movies. Right? Like if I'm not walking out of the theater right. with a big smile on my face, like that doesn't mean they're bad. Yeah. And both this and West Side Story, I'm like, okay, these are incredible, even if I'm not, you know, at a 10 of happiness walking yeah. out. I, I, for me, I, if, when I went into this, I had some concerns in the same way that I had concerns going into Captain America civil war in particular, when I was like, okay, so we have to, you're doing the civil war story. You have to wrap out the remaining winter soldier, Bucky story left over from the winter soldier. You're introducing Spider-Man. You're introducing black Panther. I'm, I was not certain they were going to land that movie until I saw it and they fucking landed it. I had the exact same concerns going into this. I was worried they were going to try and take on too much and not give it all its due. Well, we've had, you know, accurately with Spider-Man 3 and Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yeah. Anytime we have more than one villain, it gets problematic. Right. And we already knew going into this that there were five villains yes. that we'd seen in the trailer. So it's like, this is a lot, you know, and having to pick up the thread of Peter's identity being revealed. Mm-hmm. Um. So I was worried going in that it was going to be messy and they would have to handle too many things. And those fears were immediately cast aside because they, they hit it all. Yeah. They really landed it. So, um, okay. Now at this point, should we get into full spoilers? Yes. Okay. So again, in the show notes, if you have not yet seen Spider-Man and I say this with as much sincerity as I can possibly muster, despite my generally dry tone, do not listen to us. Talk about this movie. See, this movie you are doing yourself a disservice if you 
have anyone tell you what happens rather than experiencing it for yourself. Yes. I cannot emphasize this enough. I would encourage you to just flat out stop listening to the show if you need to and go see it instead of hearing what we have to say. That being said, if you want to jump ahead, I will indicate when we stop spoilers in the notes. Yeah. Anything we say isn't going to be nearly as good as Spider-Man. No. <laughs> so no. yeah, go watch that instead. Okay. That all being said, mm-hmm. they did it. <laughs> they, oh my God. The moment I cried, I cried in this movie. Same. So not I, at the same. moment that I thought I was going to cry. Okay, uh, when did you cry versus when did you think you were going to cry? I thought I was going to cry when Aunt May died because okay. that killed me inside. Oh, that I was oh. I was not expecting that. Fucking heartbreaking on such a level because you know like we didn't get the Uncle Ben. I'm like, thank God we don't have to watch Uncle Ben die. But even worse, watching Aunt May die. Yeah, that I, I that's the part I'm still processing. Like I walked out of that movie numb. Yeah, because of that, but I didn't cry at it. The yeah. part I cried was when Zendaya falls off the ledge <gasps> and Andrew Garfield jumps after her and saves her. Same. When he catches her and you see him holding her, I lost it. Yeah. I And I'm, I'm like listening around me and no one else is emoting as much as I am in this moment. And I'm like, am I the crazy one? No. I'm not the crazy one. You, you, you are not. That was my moment of the film. Um, and again, having recently revisited those movies, the Amazing Spider movies are actually quite a bit better than I remembered them being the the first one you could lose about the first hour and mm-hmm. the rest of it's pretty solid and the second one of course like suffers from there's just too much shit going on but at its core those movies are great because andrew garfield and emma stone are both fantastic actors and have such great chemistry and they're so good with those characters and i it rewatch those movies made me really love andrew garfield spider-man that much more um so obviously like heavily expected that these guys were going to show up, that he and Tom McGregor be in this movie. Like, yeah. And it basically, it had been spoiled. Like, there was a little, it was literally, <laughs> I think I meant It was the, everyone but Kevin Feige and Andrew Garfield yeah. had said that they're going to be in the movie. There, there was even a meme, because I, I follow several just, like, gay memes on Instagram. There was a meme a few months ago, and the, the joke was, like, you know, the caption was, you know, uh, you know, I don't have a type, and then it blows, like, my boyfriends, and it was literally, my ex-boyfriends, but it was the shot of the three Spider-Men together, right? So it's like, <laughs> this had been spoiled a long time ago but even then i wasn't certain they were gonna do it until they did it yeah and uh, for me and i was still shocked when st- i saw still it. still shocked and it, like andrew garfield i think i think both he and toy mcguire actually got to have fun making these because the franchise isn't resting their shoulders in a way that it was in those previous films and i feel like maybe that pressure that lack of pressure helped them just be themselves i really felt their energy in there and there's their fun but like my God, when yeah, when Zendaya falls off and Tom Holland's reaching out for her, but then gets picked up and swooped away by the Green Goblin, and then like we all kind of like, like we all kind of th- hoped maybe this would happen, and they did it. And when he catches her, and they land, like Andrew Garfield is doing so much emotionally in that moment. Like you can feel how like heartbreaking and bittersweet that moment is like he got to do the thing he failed at once before but knowing that it was for someone else is both a triumph but also just deepens the own his own pain and heartbreak at the same time and i was like it if you ever needed proof that andrew garfield is an amazing actor which there's plenty of places to go to find that evidence but in that singular moment it was there yeah like i said i cried i did too it, but it, both it, times i saw it i cried um, and I teared up that moment. It, it, it's just, there's so much happening there and he, he plays it all. And it's, it's genuinely beautiful and really, really touching when it happens. And in both the, the, both of the, uh, previous Spider-Man get that moment. Cause I think yeah. the other big emotional beat for me was when, um, Tom is about to kill Green Goblin is about to kill yeah. William Defoe, And you see the uncomfortable face of Tobey Maguire struggling to hold up, uh, he 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 grabs the uh, the glider that uh, yeah. the Green Goblin uses, um, and he's gonna stab him again, just like in in the first Spider Man. Right. The, uh, the the symmetry of that. Yes. That he got to save. He literally saves Norman the way he couldn't the first time around. Hmm. Uh, and he was gonna die the same way. And then yeah. And yeah, Toby has to hold up the the glider against Tom, and that was like I feel like that was Toby's moment. Yeah. Like you know he's regretted this death his whole life and he now gets to stop it because he even has a comment earlier when they're trying to they're trying to like science this shit and figure out how to like save all the villains which was a whole plot thread i was not expecting like they they alluded to it in that second trailer that like peter is stopping dr strange from sending them home because they're gonna die 
But I was not expecting that like half the second act leading the third act was all going to be about him literally trying to save them. Yeah. And I, and I think that's for me, the piece that really distinguishes this Spider-Man from the other versions who, who have a similar sort of like heartfelt intent, but something about Tom Holland, like he really wears his heart on his sleeve the way the other two never did. And, and for me, this is a Tom Holland career best. He is so good in this. Mm-hmm. He, I mean, he is legitimately amazing. He is doing so much all the time. Well, I think what helps with that especially is he's not wearing the hood for most of this movie. Yeah. So even when it's just Spider-Man, when it's usually just kind of the CGI or the character in the mask, we get to see him emote still. Yeah. It's not just in the voice or in kind of the eyes moving. Yeah. He... I mean, so many great performances. I mean, Tom Holland, we mentioned Andrew Garfield, obviously, but even Willem Dafoe is oh my God, so yeah. good in this. You like, you can see, like, he was great in the original Spider-Man, yeah. but he's taken that character to a whole nother level. Yeah. It's, it's funny because in some ways, this version of the character is almost more heightened, but you feel like the portrayal and the direction is more grounded. Yeah. And, you know, you can, you can kind of see when he's Norman, quote unquote, when he's Goblin. And you can but, hear it. And you can hear it. But there's also so much subtlety in his performance. Like, they're shifting back and forth a little bit. It's uh, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, of course, and Marissa Tomei as well as, as Aunt May. Like, her death scene. Like, the fact that they found a way to, like, literally squeeze in with great power comes great responsibility once again. And the not, cursed phrase. At this yeah, point. exactly. And not have it feel shoehorned in or or. or it's the pearl necklace of Spider-Man. It, it really is. It really, really is. But it's like, you know, because she seems fine. And it's the fact that she seems fine and then isn't that you're mm-hmm. just like, oh, fuck. Like, they really went there. And again, like, her performance, Tom Holland's performance in that. It, it's, oh, my God. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I know what you mean about, like, having to process it. It's the reason I went to go back and see it again yesterday. And then the ending. We haven't even talked about the ending. Right, which, yeah, sets things up in a very bizarre direction. I mean, the whole universe has forgotten who Peter Parker is. So all the Avengers, all of his friends, MJ, Ned, Happy. Like, so it ends with him, like, sad sack Spider-Man again. Like, the tiny, crappy little apartment in New York. But also, he's clearly moved away from the Stark check. Like, he's created his own costume. It's a comic-accurate costume. He's zipping around New York. Like, it's weird that this movie is simultaneously the closure of one story and also kind of the origin of the classic Spider-Man that we know. Yeah, and they did it perfectly. Yeah. And again, like, the cynical part of me was weird going into this that this was just going to be an excuse for Sony to kind of do whatever they wanted with Spider-Man. And to some degree, those fears are still there a little bit. Kevin Feige has subsequently confirmed that they are developing a fourth Spider-Man movie because he doesn't want, as he put it, people to have, like, that separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. But... There was a little bit of that worry of like, this is a way to isolate Peter from the rest of that universe so it doesn't matter if he's not crossing over with everyone, which I'm a little bit skeptical about that piece in particular. I really like his dynamic with everybody else. But if this means that we get to go back towards a more classic Spider-Man formula, I'm really intrigued to see what that looks like because this trilogy has really been built on being almost anti-Spider-Man movies in some ways. Yeah, even I made the point to you before I saw the movie, which I think is, is very funny now in, in hindsight, of this Tom Holland is is the least Spider-Man Spider-Man we've had because mm-hmm. he doesn't fit the tropes. Mainly, he's not a poor Spider-Man. Right, yeah. Because you mentioned that, and yeah. I didn't say anything. Hours had, before watching it, I mentioned that. Yeah, I had seen it already, and you had not, and I didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. I didn't say anything, Cameron. No, I know. I know, and I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Cameron, who literally told me that he refused to talk to me for, like, the 72 hours between... Yeah, so you saw it on Monday. I, yes, I was very fortunate. Yes. I was very able, happy for you. I was able to go to a press screening on Monday for work, um, which... And you you texted me when you got out. Yes. All, and all I sent you was just a mind-blown emoji. And a gif of William Defoe. <laughs> well, when you told me that you wouldn't talk to me, then I sent you a gif of William Defoe. Yes. So for, for 72 hours, you were dead to me. I know. And the, I... the joke on the podcast is we're not friends outside of the outside of the podcast. <laughs> we were not friends for 72 yeah, hours. Well, that's not true. You were not my friend for yes, 72 okay, hours. Yeah. I was fine. Um, yes. I was very, very fortunate to be able to see it um, early um and luckily like we were able to talk about it at length for work because we recorded a podcast on it like immediately um but it, it it was challenging to have a very limited group of people to talk to about the film you were a knowledge holder yeah that's what scared me i mean so we i think i think the timing of the screening was 
either concurrent with the premiere or maybe even slightly before the premiere. I forget exactly how they I think you were like an out. hour before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but like by 7 p.m. on Monday, I had seen the movie, um, which was nuts. And I was just like, holy fuck. Like, and that's why I had to go see it a second time. It's like I needed, and I will say this if I had seen it just once, it probably would have been higher up my list. It was on a second viewing rather than, okay, you know what? All the Spider Men stuff is fucking brilliant and better than I thought it would be. Like, I expected mm-hmm. those moments to happen. I did not expect it to be this good. It's that much better. On a second viewing, a lot of the first and second act is a little bit slow for me. I would be perfectly honest. I fell asleep a little bit on the second viewing and some parts in the middle. I Yeah, I I understand why they're there, um, but I think you can cut Electro and the Lizard. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a lot. Um, I think Salmon is great because he kind of plays both sides. Um, obviously, Doc Ock you need there. Obviously, Green yeah. Goblin you need there. there. There's a lot happening, and I think Marvel can sometimes be really good about, and I think Disney's in general sometimes really good about like the ending of the movie is so good. that You're kind of willing to forgive the rest of it being a little bit slow. I think of rogue one as being a great example, like mm-hmm. rogue one for me makes that film, the ending. Um, that's why I went down a little bit on a second viewing once I had fully processed it. was like, actually a lot of the rest of this is a little bit slow. Um, and good, but not as, Pacey and fun and frenetic for me is like I said, Shang Chi, which ultimately was why it, it, it eked out No Way Home. But. There was um one thing from the trailers that made me very nervous for the movies, and it was the trailers gave every quippy line that Doctor Strange has. They oh, they showed yeah. us those, and I was worried that like, what is this Doctor Strange we're gonna get? Once you see him in the movie, he's he's normal Doctor Strange. Yeah, you know he's he's just as kind of jaded. He he has his snark. He has his edge to him. Um, but he's not just quips like they, yeah. they make him seem in the trailer yeah. where he's in his fluffy coat and holding his cocoa being like, Scooby do this shit guys. Yeah. And again, he's great in this too. And I love Dr. Strange. That first movie is one of my favorite MCU movies. The, when you talk about like, this is the most Spider-Man movie. I think their first interaction is maybe one of the funniest moments mm-hmm. I've had with any Spider-Man where, you know, Dr. Strange is like, you know, you, you got your rejection letter from college and you, you contacted the board and you know, they still said no. It's like, what? you didn't contact the board and explain your situation. I didn't know I was allowed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you decided to change the course of the universe before calling someone. And then immediately just teleported him out of the sanctum. Yeah, uh, done with you. Yeah. It, it's this movie is great. Yeah, it is really, really fucking incredible. Um, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm excited. I'm nervous to see it again. Just cause like, I'm, I, I'm afraid to go through that emotional process it's, again. It's a lot. I mean, it's, it, there's a special towards the end that there's a lot to go through. And I, I think it's a credit to the really fantastic filmmaking here. And, and I, I think filmmaking is the best way to put it because it, it hits multiple levels. Like there's great direction here. There's great writing. Obviously Kevin Feige is a fantastic producer. Amy Pascal clearly didn't get in his way very much. Um, but like, the fact that the most emotionally heartbreaking moment of the whole thing when Aunt May dies, the next scene is the introduction of Andrew. And that is mostly played really fun. You know, it's like, when he just puts his hand up, and he just puts his hand ceiling. up and like, you know, and MJ is still skeptical, like literally throwing bread <laughs> at him. Like it's, it's so goofy, but like, you know, God, I, I just have a hard time when people are so dismissive of Marvel because very few Filmmakers, studios, production companies, whatever you want to call it, very few can pull off those huge swings from like genuine emotional impact to like fun, lighthearted banter and have it all still feel of a tone and of a piece. So Mm -hmm. few can pull that off. And this movie has some of the biggest swings across the MCU in terms of that. And it it hits them all. Yeah. No pun intended. No pun intended. Um, But yeah, man, I mean. Andrew Garfield stole a movie for me. Yeah, same. Stole the movie. I'm so happy he did. I was too. not expecting. So when he cracks Toby's back, that was awesome. Oh my god! So, <laughs> the, yeah, the the, the reference is okay. The through line of Toby's back problems. The references they pull. The the fact that they got <laughs> Willem Dafoe to do the "I'm something of a scientist myself" line and have it land. It's a audible cheer from it, my from yeah, my audience they literally put a meme into the movie and it fucking worked yeah also we have not even mentioned this yet matt murdoch 
Oh my god, yeah. Oh my god. So yeah. much happens in this movie that you can forget <laughs> that Matt Murdock is introduced in a brilliant scene that again we were talking about this before we recorded i did not think would happen until it happened agreed yeah and that's and so again like even the, after the like the spoilers came out and like the, the right. leaks came out i'm like no this is yeah. tampered well and also if people have been watching hawkeye spoiler for hawkeye but like the kingpin you've seen hawkeye now right yes yeah okay. yeah, yeah we, we talked about this already <laughs> okay yeah, the kingpin is introduced at the end of episode five of hawkeye which came out we'll call it a day basically before the movie premiered mm-hmm. i saw that in reverse yeah so I didn't know that was happening. Now, it was clearly heading towards Kingpin in that show. The speculation was there. But, like, that data point did not yet exist for me when I saw the movie. So, like, when they introduced him, I was like, oh, fuck. They did it. They brought Charlie Cox back, and he's great. Yeah. And he catches a fucking brick. Catches a brick because <laughs> he's a good lawyer. <laughs> it's, yeah, his reason is I'm a really good lawyer. Like, I, oh, I'm getting myself worked up just talking about I know. it. It's, it's. We may watch it again tonight. <laughs> it's still in the air. I don't know if I need to see it a third time in, 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 in a, a week. week. Yeah. Um, but it, it is phenomenal. I mean, I don't know why we keep telling you it's phenomenal. Because uh, my God, again, I hope you've seen it. Because if you listen to us talk about it instead of seeing it, you've just you've ruined a great movie for yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, I still think the movie is it would be incredible if you if you know what happens. But yeah, it's not. You you need the shock factor. Uh, anything else to say on Spider Man? before we move on to our number ones right our number ones number yeah ones. um i think i think that covers everything that i wanted to talk about okay yeah it's it's so good i drove back got out of the theater and just sat in silence for like <laughs> a good hour yeah uh and i still feel like I'm, I'm sitting in silence it's it's a lot it's a lot but it's fantastic uh all right cameron what is your number one movie this year? Yes. I had a hard time picking a number one movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but through what I've seen the most this year, what I've gone back to for comfort many mm-hmm. times this year, what I've listened to the most this year, because to finish my list of musical top fives, my number one is In the Heights. Oh, fair. I have yet to see In the Heights. It's, uh, I watched it oh, maybe three times when it first popped up popped up on HBO Max. Yeah. I've been listening to the soundtrack, you know, two th- two to three times a week. Yeah. Every week since it came out. Mm-hmm. And then when I've been flying back and forth, I'll I'll put on the first, you know, the first act again just cuz yeah. it's like every character is so charming. Yeah. Every song is so, you know, it's it's very Lin Manuel Miranda. Obviously mm-hmm. he wrote these songs pre Hamilton. Right. So it is, you know, you see where Hamilton came from with mm-hmm. these songs. Um yeah, it's it's such a beautiful movie, and I I think I could probably watch it every week and be yeah. happy. That's fantastic. Like I I love love musical. I love such something that's like really heartwarming. So I really need to get on this and see this at some point. Mm-hmm. It probably would have made it somewhere in my top ten at least if I'd seen it. Yeah, I think it would. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I I I have nothing else to say about it. It's just yeah. such a lovely, that's so nice, lovely film. Well, I, I think again, like the fact that it's your top film speaks uh, speaks a lot. Of how, yeah, how much you like it. So. Yeah, it was it was a, a tough list to make. We'll it talk was. about that in a second. But but yeah. first, please share your number one. I'm very okay. curious to hear this. So again, it was hard for me. I think my my top three were kind of battling it out. Um, I do not think my top film is the best film that came out this year. Oh, same. Yeah, yeah. I don't think In the Heights is the best um, film. I, I think ah, for me, of all the things I saw, it might be The Heart of They Fall. It's either The Heart of They Fall or or Dune. It's like the best film that I saw this year. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff I did not see this year. Yes. Um, but for me... That's the other Netflix one, right? What? The Heart, Heart of They, they Fall? Fall? The, uh, the other Netflix one? Isn't, is that the one with Leo? No, that's Look Up, uh, which I have not seen yet. No, no. I've The whole time you've been talking about this movie, I thought you were talking about Look Up. <laughs> well, I kept talking about it being a Western. <laughs> what? The Heart of They Fall is the Western. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I am all mixed up now. Okay. That was my number two film. Yes. I think that is a better film than what my top film is. But for me, this was my most anticipated movie of several years. Oh, my God. Duh. How did I not yes. think of this? <laughs> and it, it had to ultimately go in my top spot because I... it Because you're you. Well, I'm, I'm me, but like I, I also feel like I have to like... Like, caveat <laughs> the cliche of this. So It is also a good movie. Yeah, so for those of you who have not yet figured it out, my top film of the year was, in fact, No Time to Die. And I will say this. That was not always a guarantee. But it was going to be my top film of the year. And again, it was a debate for me up to the very end. But 
that movie was so anticipated for me and I was so concerned about it in a lot of ways just because I've been so disappointed by Spectre. Um, and knowing that it was going to be the finale of Craig's arc and knowing it was going to be almost three hours long and so many things had me worried about it going in. And the fact that I loved it as much as I did, I think just ultimately speaks to just how good of a film it ultimately ended up being. Like it has two of my all time favorite set pieces across all of Bond. Like not necessarily my, my absolute favorites, but like in the, in the high end pantheon of set pieces between the, um, the DB5 chase in the beginning, and then the whole Cuba sequence, which the I think I is slept through. the one you slept through, which is probably the best sequence of the whole movie. <laughs> Anna to Armas just being a fucking amazing. Yeah. But like, you know, it took the mistakes of Spectre and made up for them, which is not an easy thing to do necessarily. It had, I think, the right closure for Craig's character. It ended the right way. It's not like... It's not what I expected. It's not necessarily how I would have like thought to have done it, but I think it was the right call. Um, it really makes those five films feel of a singular piece. Um, you know, the fact that they they brought one Hans Zimmer score and this is fantastic. Again, I was worried because like I, I was worried it's gonna be too Zimmery, and there are points when the score feels a little bit like The Dark Knight, but. There's like I think his version of like the upbeat action Bond theme is one of the best. The fact that he brought back some uh, theme pieces from Honor, Majesty, and Service, which is one of my all-time favorite Bond films, I think the best Bond score ever made. Like it just hit so many things that I wanted. It gave me things that I didn't know that I wanted that I loved, and it could have been awful. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was so good and that I have loved it that much more every time. I've seen it three times. It's the only film this year that I've seen three times. It's been nine hours of this year. Yeah, <laughs> watching this movie. Honestly, I should be spending that's not, closer, that's, that's not that I much. Be spending closer to twelve to fifteen this year yeah. watching this. I mean, to be fair, you've only had two months to watch it. Yeah, that's true. Of <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I've watched it thrice in that time, you know, it's and again, it's not for everyone. That's fine, but for like for me, for how much that character, that franchise in particular. Craig's Bond has meant to me like I literally like grew up with those movies Casino Royale came out when I was 17 I was in high school mm -hmm. and like th that it gave me so much that I loved just meant a lot and I, I just I really really fucking love that movie and I'm, I'm so excited by the fact that I do um and like that's ultimately I was like you know it has to be my top film because it's the movie that had the most impact on me yeah ultimately this year um you know and I there are other years when the James Bond film would not have been my top movie <laughs> so yes I I also enjoyed the movie I I really really liked yeah. the movie I I honestly wish I had the same background knowledge that you and Shane had going in yeah so I could enjoy it more right like the little things you guys caught on. Mm -hmm. Uh, like, and I could, you know, I want the enjoyment I had was watching you two react to the movie because <laughs> that was honestly more fun than watching the movie. Yeah. Uh, was, you know, seeing, you know, seeing two little kids squirming oh, next to me of any, God. anytime a car popped up and just like, Oh my God, it's the, it's the, it's the car. Yeah. Yeah. It's the uh, advantage from the yeah. daylight. It looks so good. It's, it's the thing. It's the thing. I know that gun. I know that gun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that was incredibly exciting for me to watch it, yeah. that, that, you know, that made me, that made a good part of my year was, yeah. was finally seeing that play out for, for <sighs> the both of you. God, it was fucking amazing. I love, I just, I love it. I love it. It, 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 it had to be, of it course had it had to be number one. Okay. We have gone on so long. Let's do this real quick. Yes. Other, other honorable mentions and then just real quick stuff we're excited for next year. So honorable mention films for this year for you, Cameron. Uh, I can quick. I only have two. Okay. Uh, free guy. Uh, oh yeah so much better than i expected it to be still haven't seen it I oh my god it. i think it's it's coming to disney plus very soon i think, I think so. within the next week or two i think so yeah um it's so much fun it's so much better than the trailers make it look right. the trailers are good yeah um it's great and my other choice is a very out of left field movie i didn't think i was going to enjoy it almost made my top five mm -hmm. uh it's a it's a uh, japanese movie called words bubble up like soda pop oh it's a cool time and it's this cute um like slice of life movie uh, around these two kids that both kind of have their own insecurities uh, who end up falling for each other. One kid um, 
is just very scared of like public appearances and just doesn't like being around people. Very introverted. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the way he communicates is basically writes haikus about everything he experiences in the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the other girl is kind of this very outgoing, very public figure. uh, But she has very, she has big um, body positivity problem. How do I put that better? She doesn't like the way she looks. Sure. Uh, and so she's trying to kind of cut, she, you know, she wears a mask to cover her braces. She kind of wears a, an oversized hoodie to cover her body. Uh, and it's the two of them kind of combating these problems they have with each, well, with themselves while being around each other. Yeah. And it's just really sweet. It's really that hard. It's nice. It's yeah. uh, the animation on it. It's animated. Um, <laughs> I, I just assumed. Yeah. Um, the color palette is so bright mm-hmm. and it's so different from anything I've seen. Um, it's it's just a, a really nice picky up movie. Yeah. Okay, that sounds cute. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what well, what is your short list? Um, or your your so honorable, honorable mentions, mentions. I mean, yeah, we, we talked. I liked about No Way Home. So that's already <laughs> on there. Um, Mitchell's versus the Machines was. I I meant it. I still have not seen it. It's really cute. It's a lot better than I thought it was. It's it's Lord and Miller who always do such a great job. It's yes. it's really cute. Very energetic. Very original. Super fun. Um. Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar, which I expected you <laughs> absolutely hate, and I was surprised by how much fun I had with it. It is so dumb, but it works. I kept seeing the cover art for it, and be like, I'm never gonna watch this movie. Yeah, but I, I, everyone like, who's seen it I said was, it's so like, fun. Adamantly refusing to watch it until my friend Josh, like, no, we gotta watch this. And I, I, I'm at this point tired of my life of Josh always being right, and so I'm like, <laughs> okay, fine, let's watch it. And I, I did really enjoy it. Um, Gunpowder Milkshake, which oh, I'm glad that's good. It's it's you know, uh, it didn't really get traction for me until like the third act, but I really, really enjoyed the third act. Um, there's some fun stuff prior to that. It's kind of a mess, but I still liked it. It's, it's a sticky one. It's one that I keep thinking about. Um, so I think it's worth checking out. If it's not necessarily brilliant, but I liked a lot about it. Um, plus Karen Gillan's always fantastic. It's of course. A, it's a great, it's a ridiculous cast. Great cast. Yeah. Uh, and the last one, you know, it says at the end of the day, like a, a Batman cartoon podcast. I really enjoyed both part one and two of the long Halloween adaptations. Good. I, I still have not finished those. Yeah. Part one for maybe a little bit more than mm-hmm. part two. It does make some changes to the comic, but I think they mostly work. Um, I think the animation style is, it's kind of like we are talking about with Invincible. Like it's a little bit simplistic, but I think it mostly works. Um, and again, that's probably my second favorite comic of all time. So that's like a full five. It's the, for me the best Batman comic ever. And it's a full five star comic. I think this is a fairly, it's a, of the adaptations they could have done. I think this does it justice for the most part. Good. So I think it's well worth watching both parts. And they're both mm-hmm. are on HBO Max now at this point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to throw out, because you brought up Mitchell and the Machine, I, I almost watched it, but I chose to watch another movie last night called Ron Gone Wrong. How was that? So much better than I thought it was going to okay. be. Okay, yeah. It's it, on Disney Plus now, right? Yeah, it, that's yeah, why yeah. I watched it. It just came on Disney Plus. It is a very, it's a, it's a kid's movie, mm-hmm. which is, you know, the, the forefront of it. But the messages in it, you know, it's, it's a parallel of, of kids having phones. Of like okay. being both more open to the world, but also more shut off from the world. Yeah. Um, oh, because that's the one where he has a like it's an old phone, so it's no longer connected to the network or whatever, right? He has he has a de- uh, a uh, defective robot. Okay, that's right. Yeah, Ron. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very cute. I think it has great messages, especially for people you know with kids to show, mm-hmm. but also you know us jaded old folk who didn't grow up with iPhones. <laughs> uh, we're we're <laughs> we're like. Uh, giving a pat on our back for our, yeah. for our for our uh, jaded messages. Oh, back when we had to like like text out. I don't even know what that's. It's not. I don't even know what it's called. Oh, now. on on the on the number pad. On the keyboard. number pad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, t- a T nine. T nine. That sounds right. Yeah. Oh. Um. Man, back in the day. No, I think that's the calculator. The T eighty nine is the. <laughs> well, but I think I think T. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it's literally been twenty years. So I don't remember. <laughs> so. Uh. But yeah. It's it's a really sweet movie. All yeah. the characters are really sweet. Um, yeah, it, I think it's worth, you know, if you, if your family needs something to watch over the holidays and you don't mm-hmm. want to watch something festive, okay. it's a nice family movie. Ron goes wrong. Wrong. Mm-hmm. Ron gone, gone wrong. Gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Nice. It is not Metabots like I thought it was going to be. Okay. All right. Uh, and then, uh, real quick, what's some stuff coming up next year, either TV or film that you're really excited about? Yes. Uh, obviously all Marvel Star Wars. They right. have a pretty amazing slate for 2022. Yeah. So just real quick, uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Thor, Love and Thunder, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1, mm-hmm. uh, She-Hulk, Miss Marvel, and Moon Knight plus Kenobi. So like, great Big list. slate. And, and uh, Bad, Batch, uh, Bad Batch Season <gasps> 2. That too, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Uh, but outside of that, uh, the things that we've 
are confirmed so far for movies. Turning Red looks so cute. It looks really cute. The next yeah. Pixar movie. Yeah. It's a very bizarre premise. Yeah. Which is, I think, just a big parallel for, you know, puberty, obviously. Yeah. I have it on my list as well. Um, the Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. <laughs> okay. I have that as well. This is a movie where Nicolas Cage is basically playing a version of himself that is paid to go meet, like, a Colombian drug lord. A super fan. Who's also a super fan. And I've heard about this movie for years. And it's mm-hmm. finally out. And the trailer looks just as bananas as I hoped it would. I honestly <laughs> thought the movie was already out yeah. until the trailer came out. I'm like, oh, man, we can't watch it yet. I, I want to watch it. I mean, it looks like super meta software Nick Cage. So it's either going to be terrible or great. I'm hoping for the latter. Yes. Um, uh, Lightyear. Very, yeah. very curious how that's going to be. Yeah, same. Um, and then I just found out this is coming out. Uh, there's a Whitney Houston biopic coming out at the end oh. of next year called I Want to Dance with Somebody. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, Whitney Houston has had a very weird parallel to my life. Uh, her, I wanted him somebody came out the day before I was born. Okay. Uh, and my first time coming out to LA is when she died. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, <laughs> I was supposed to go to the Grammy. I did go to the Grammys. My mom and I got tickets Yeah. and she was supposed to be the headliner. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately she passed away the day before the, the award ceremony. Oh, for, I got this, it was the day before, wasn't it? My mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, love her. Love her music. Very <laughs> okay. excited for that. Yeah uh quick series lord of the ring series mm-hmm. very curious what that's gonna be yeah uh, i'm sure it's gonna have a much bigger budget than wheel of time yep uh this one's coming out in january and i'm so i forgot it's a series not a movie uh pam and tommy oh that's a series that's yeah, right on yeah. hulu gonna follow the the tragedy <laughs> of the pamela anderson and tommy what's his last name tommy lee tommy lee thank you uh their sex tape getting leaked yeah with Lily Evans and Sebastian Stan. Who look incredible. They do. And I actually, th- I think that's also Craig Gillespie, if I recall. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because because uh, obviously Sebastian Stan was in Itania. Yeah. Uh, He's good. He's very good. Yeah, that looks hilarious. Um, and then a weird one I just saw a trailer for coming to HBO is called Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. Oh, that's right. It's, it, it's, it's not a docuseries. It's fictional, right? It's a narrative. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels... Like a midpoint, from what I understand about Succession, it feels like a midpoint between Succession and Semi Pro. Oh <laughs> the Will Ferrell. Oh my God. <laughs> Only you. Only you, Cameron, would come up with that data point. But yeah, I think you're right. So, mm-hmm. hey, we don't give a fuck about sports. No. And it still got you excited. So, yeah. I mean, I, I am loosely excited for basketball. I just can't ever show it because I'm a nerd. One of our closest friends is like the biggest basketball fan we know. How do you not get a chance to share this ever? Because I, I don't keep up with it. Oh, okay. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I enjoy the sport. It's weird. Okay. Uh, what, what is on your most most anticipated? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, kind of the same thing. The the slate. I, I actually think that some of the DC movies next year I am kind of excited about. I'm very intri- I'm intrigued by Black Adam, if not necessarily for Black Adam himself, but for the inclusion of the JSA. Yes, so that, that I'm is excited true. about. I mean, in particular, oh my God, Pierce Brosnan is Dr. Fate. Fucking brilliant. Um, I'm a, interested in The Flash just because it looks weird and it could be interesting, but I feel like now it's got very big shoes to fill. I'm just so nervous. It's probably not going to be very I'm good. I'm not excited. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking good. And like, as of right now, like the, for me, like the movie, like my top, I must see this movie next year is still The Batman. Like I'm still, I'm mm-hmm. very skeptical about that in a lot of ways, but at the end of the day, it's a new Batman movie. Um, and it has a Michael Giacchino Batman score. I that mean, is true. I that, mean, that is the the two yeah. the diagrams of Chris coming together. Like, I'm sorry, shy of Giacchino scoring a James Bond movie, like that's basically the like, the top of the list for me. So like, I am very excited about that movie at the end of the day. Um, but outside of the things we normally talk about, the stuff I'm excited for, um, uh, the we, we already talked about the unbearable weight of massive talent, which I had on there. Um, Operation Fortune, Ruse de Gur. I sent you the trailer recently. It's the new Guy Ritchie movie. Oh, no, I sent you the trailer for that. No, I sent it to oh. you. No, no, you sent the trailer for Everything Everywhere All at Once, which okay. is the new Michelle Yeoh movie, which is yeah. also on my list. Okay. That looks bizarre and fun. But no, Operation Fortune, Ruse de Guerre is the new yes, Guy Ritchie yes, yes, movie. Yes, yes, yes. yes, with Jason Statham as an assassin. No surprise there. Um, but then Josh Hartnett playing an actor, kind of in a similar story a little bit to The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Like being brought in because the criminal is a super fan. The trailer just looks super fun and snappy, and I, I still haven't seen the gentleman, but I know you spoke very highly of it. It's so good. I got to watch that at some point. So that's on my list. Um, I wasn't expecting this to be on my list, but the Lost City, 
the trailer just came out. It's, That's, it's a very similar. <laughs> all the movies of next year kind of have a very similar like, world to them. There's a meta thing going on for real life. But yeah, it's it's Sandra Bullock as a romance author. I guess it's kind of like Romance in the Stone, which I've never seen. But like a romance author who discovers she might actually be able to find this like lost. Or no, it's Daniel Radcliffe as the villain. Yes. Who, might, who wants her to help him find the real lost city. And then her cover model played by Channing Tatum goes to try and rescue her. It looks super stupid. Channing Tatum, who's, who's just being Fabio. Yeah, like stupid in the best way possible. That looks super fun. Um, there's a movie that the trailer hasn't come out yet, but I'm interested in. It's called Bullet Train, but it's the new David Leach movie. So he's okay. one of the two guys who directed Wick. John Wick, and he's directed the subsequent ones. He also directed Deadpool Atomic 2. And, uh, and Atomic Bomb, okay. which I loved. Um, but, you know, it's like basically a bunch of assassins are on a Japanese bullet train. But the cast, Brad Pitt, Joey King, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Brian Tyree Henry, Zazie Beetz, Masioka, Michael Shannon, Logan Lerman, um, uh, Hiroyuki Sonata, like Sandra Bullock. Like it's a ridiculous <laughs> fucking cast. And I'm, it just looks really cool and weird and different. Yeah, Brad Pitt's in two things next year, right? And both of them. He's have also pretty... in the Lost City. Oh, is he, is he really? He's in the Lost City. Yeah. Um, and then Mission Impossible 7, just, you know, uh, again, Christopher McQuarrie continues to do great Mission Impossible movies. Super excited for that. From the TV side of things, um, I'm really looking forward to Halo. Yeah. I've been waiting for yeah, a Halo yeah, yeah. show for 20 years, and this looks pretty damn good. And um, if it's a, even a semi-decent adaptation of the Fall of Reach book, which is way better than it has any right to be for a book based off of a video game, I'm super, super excited for that. Um, so there's that, and then there's a show called The After Party, which is like a, an ensemble murder mystery comedy. I'm already in. Um, I, know, I know it has Sam Richardson and um, I don't know someone else in it, but it's it's a really it's it's got a really fantastic cast. And then the last thing is apparently Donald Glover is co-creating and starring in a remake of Mr. and Mrs. Smith for TV, like the Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie awesome. action comedy. So there's some fun stuff coming out next year. Um, some lots of good stuff to look forward to, but. Oh, Dave Franco is going to be in uh, the after party. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. It's a good cast. Finn Schwartz. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it looks pretty damn funny. So, oh, and Tiffany Haddish. That's who I was trying to think of. Yeah. She, she's in it as well. Alana Glazer. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great cast. Yeah. But I think that finally does it for us. I think it's the longest episode we've done in a really, <laughs> a really, really long time, but there was apparently a lot to talk about. So. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this list. Uh, would love to hear your guys' thoughts on like, what are some of your favorite things you saw this last year and what you're excited about next year as well. Yeah. There's a lot we missed. So like so help much. us fill, fill out what we didn't see. So much we missed. Yeah. And there's other stuff that we watched and enjoyed. Just didn't get a chance to talk about. Mm -hmm. Go see snake eyes. It's still better than it should be. But it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> Maybe someday. Uh, but if you want to reach us, you can, can at uh tim talk pod on facebook twitter instagram and gmail yes, and you yes, can yes. find me at lordifer on twitter and instagram yeah if you want to see my art you can find that at cameron.dexter if you want to see my face you can find that at cam dexter underscore adventure yay we will be back in january date tbd depends on some travel arrangements yes um but we will be back to finish out justice league unlimited and the dc animated universe in january of next year and hopefully we're gonna have some guests on too yeah which we're looking forward to but uh, yeah we are we are winding things down i think it's fair to say this is our last bonus episode mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy i know but we did it 50 bonus episodes. That sounds great. Yep. <laughs> nice closing point right there. Mm -hmm. That's a good uh, whole number. Yes. But thank you everyone for listening. Uh, happy holidays. Have a lovely new year. Stay safe and stay inside. Stay, stay, <laughs> stay inside and watch all the things we talked about. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.